Good afternoon. Welcome to the Hearing Aid Dispensers Committee meeting. I'm very excited that it's actually in person. Um, let's uh, call to order and have the roll call. Marsha Raggio. Here. Karen Chang. Here. Amy White. Here. And Committee Chair Todd Borges. Here. We also have a public location, Gelleritz Family Education Center. Uh, Gilda, are you with us? Here, I am. Could you identify your location and address and whether or not any members of the public are there with you? I am at the Galeras Family Education Center, 427 West Carroll Avenue, room number two, Glendora, California, 91741. And no members of the public are here with me. Thank you very much. First, we'd like to um, have public comment for items not on the agenda. Let's start first with uh, anyone here in the physical location of the meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, also, if there is any public comments um, not on the agenda and the, uh, that happens to be piping in through the WebEx, this is the moderator. We are now accepting public comments on WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star 3 to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. Let's take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to close comment at this time? Or, for, forgive me, move on to uh, uh, Gilda Dominguez? Yeah. Uh, we have a request that just came in from Patrick. Bear with us just a moment, Patrick, and we will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Uh, hello there, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to comment. I had a quick question uh, if we will be discussing if remote supervision uh, will be allowed uh, for RPEs. Oh. Right, I know. Um, well, that's not something that we'll be discussing during um, the hearing and dispensing committee uh, meeting. I think that would be something that we can put on a future agenda for the um, actual board meeting or possibly the upcoming audiology practice committee agenda. He says thank you in text. You're very welcome. And now that it appears to be the end of our request for comments at the moment. Great, thank you very much. Uh, then we'll move on to uh, item three, uh, discussion and possible action to amend or adopt regulations regarding continuing education requirements and continuing education course content requirements for hearing aid dispensers and dispensing audiologists. We have in the pack that's under um, had three. The board has gone through and made a number of the uh, changes that we are proposing that we'd like to take an opportunity to talk about now that we have a lovely quorum. Sharice, did you want to go through each item or would you like me to go through it? At, at your pleasure, I can do that for you if you'd like. You have such a lovely voice. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, the Hearing Aid Dispensing Committee is looking at making changes to the continuing education requirements for the hearing aid dispensers. And uh, the most recent ones um, include quite a few different technical changes um, as well as some substantive changes. So if you look at attachment A, I'll just kind of go through them as, as they are. 
So um, we are making some clarifying technical changes at the top. It just makes it clearer and then gets rid of the old reference to 2017. Uh, we're also removing any gendered language. Um, we're also removing subdivision E about um, renewals for the first time because we don't actually have the statutory authority to do so. Um, the other is making uh, the when you've been expired for uh, three years to be consistent with our statutes and um, for when a license was canceled. The next one is um, clarifying on applicants for initial licensure, the continuing education requirements. And G is a new provision that we're looking at adding, so it would be similar to the speech language pathology and audiology. And that would allow for courses that you teach to also be credited to you, um, I mean once. So if you teach the same course multiple times, you can use it once per renewal cycle. So that's a provision we have on the speech and audiology side that we'd like to bring over to the dispensing side as well. Um, and then in H, it's the recommendation. We have statutory authority to do so. And then it's also, I think, um, good practice. And also it's a very good learning experience that participation in examination, administration, or development. Um, we just want to make sure we talk about how many hours they should be receiving. Um, obviously, um, boards differ, and we run a practical examination. So if you participate in the practical examination, that's administration. So um, whether or not we want to make a up to a number of hours that can be accrued that way during a um, year. Um, normal, normal boards um, only have examination development activities, such as going to an Office of Professional Examination Services uh, uh, workshop where they're developing the questions or deciding on the scoring and the cutoffs and those things. Um, so our board, because we have the practical, we have subject matter experts that participate in the practical examination for hearing aid dispensers. Um, it's a great opportunity. There's a lot of professional conversations that happen there. There is a lot of reviewing of different techniques and how the field's changing. Um, it's not exactly the same as exam development, but um, it's both are, I think, viable ways to accrue some continuing education. So we just might want to look at well, what do we think the maximum number of hours is. Um, and then the last one in that first section is, um, again, I mean, it's also part of, I believe, their orders, but it also specifies here. So if you're taking continuing education coursework as part of your probation, it does not count towards your renewal requirement. So there's no double dipping when it comes to CE for probation versus your renewal. So those are all the changes in the first section on 140. The next section is where we had the conversation at the last uh, committee um, about the need to allow certain amount of fitting, programming, and troubleshooting that's related to equipment and devices, and how do we allow for those courses of, that benefit consumers' use of the hearing aid, but also restrict the more marketing, launching, promo type continuing education. So uh, we went ahead and looked at this, and the, the blanket course content we removed but we have added in the direct client care courses that it could include content on fitting, programming, and troubleshooting of equipment, devices, or other products of a particular manufacturer or company only as it relates to benefiting a client's hearing and functional use of the equipment, device, or product. And then we've added over to the what's outside of the scope of acceptable courses more about course content that's focused on marketing, launching, or demonstrating the marketability of the equipment, devices, or other products. So trying to get more towards allowing the more consumer beneficial um, aspects about particular devices, but also saying, no, if it's about marketing, launching, profitability, um, those kind of things, that way those are still prohibited and staff would be reviewing those course outlines and the materials so that they can kind of fetter that out. But this was our first attempt to get something out there that would allow that beneficial fitting programming and troubleshooting part for equipment, but still restricting the marketing promotional type stuff. Sharice, uh -huh. why don't we pause there and we can maybe go through some of these in case anyone has questions or comments, yeah. just while it's a little bit fresh. 
Okay, Absolutely. so we can break it up a little bit. Um, so the first um, highlighted area, um, does anyone have any questions or concerns or issues with that changing basically that uh, a hearing licensee holds a hearing aid dispensing license when applying for license renewal? Does anyone have any issues with that? I think mostly it's just cleanup language, right? Yeah, okay. And then of course the, the, the non-gender pronoun, I don't think anyone would have an issue with that. Okay. And apologies, we forgot to highlight the, um, the increase to four hours instead of three for the indirect or related care courses. Sorry, um, we missed highlighting that, but that was, that was one thing discussed at the last committee meeting that we would like in there, or right. that was preferred, and so we have that in there. We just missed highlighting it, so it wasn't bright yellow for you. Anyone have any questions about the, uh, the changes on the first page? Okay. So page two. Any issues with the licensee obtain, getting hours for the course they're teaching? At least once per year? Once. Which I think is appropriate, otherwise yeah. they'll want to teach it every month. <laughs> and that's in line with what it is now. We only get credit for one, yeah. for one course. And we can't take the same course twice yeah. and get credit for it. So that's pretty much in line with what the regs are now. Yeah. Definitely no repeating. All right. So H, giving exam hours to or credit hours to those who do the exam or the workshops. That was actually in place quite a few years ago, and then it kind of seemed to go away. And I almost kind of felt like it was coming back almost kind of as a carrot to get people to do the exams and the workshops, because I know they have a lot of difficulty getting people to do that. My personal feeling is though that they shouldn't get, honestly, more than four hours simply because one day at a workshop or at an exam, you wipe out your whole year's worth of continuing ed credits or close to it. And there is a lot of good back and forth and discussion and whatnot, but you're not really actually doing anything to further your education as a way to help the consumer. You know, so I feel like we should, you know, limit those hours to some number. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, maybe also consider, um, you know, you're not, you want to get accrue more than X number of hours per day. You know, I don't think doing the exam, for example, we should be getting, I don't know, more than X number of hours. I think, um, you know, doing the workshop development on, on uh, test development is pretty involved. That one's really interesting, I think. Um, but again, I don't think it should be based on the number of hours you're sitting there. It should just be, well, if you're going to participate in this particular event, you can get X um, hours and then not to exceed so many per, per renewal cycle. Karen, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. Uh, four hours is, is good, too. I think it's enough of a carrot to get people to, you know, if, if we're using it as a carrot without necessarily just, you know, letting them bang everything out in one day and then, you know, they're, then they're done. So do we agree we like the four hours? Do we think it should be less, more? Do you think four hours is a maximum? That's what I was thinking. And they get that in one day? Or is that, or are we going to limit that? For one, perform performance is the wrong word. Well, the, ex <laughs> the exam is one day. The difference is the workshops, which are two days. We actually run examinations two days in a row nowadays. Uh, we do them on a Friday and a Saturday. So, oh, uh, really? Some people do two days in a row. Some people only come on Friday. Some people only come on Saturday. Um, Interesting. We, we take what we can so that we can run our, our examinations right now. And um, we do a, a different protocol, bigger room, uh, fewer number of people, 
Is that why room. it's two days now because there's fewer people per day? Yeah, so, so we're working to keep it safe, but in three rooms, and there are two rooms in our office that are conference rooms and then a conference room down the hall. So. Okay, interesting. Okay. Two hours per day. Um, yeah, I, I guess if it's going to be two days, then yeah, I guess we would have to break it down further then. Okay. Yeah, I, would, I would agree. I think two hours per day and then okay. then that encourages people to participate for two days, whether that be at the exam proctoring or, or a workshop, a full workshop. Okay. Okay. So we'd, then we'd be looking at changing that to actually saying two, well, it already says each day of service, so two hours for each day of service. Okay. And then that, they would still have to come up with eight hours on their own. Okay. Okay. And does anyone have any issue with the um, the next paragraph concerning probation and getting your hours while on probation? Okay. Todd, can we have uh, Sharice read the changes? And did we talk about a cap on the number of hours, I know per day, but uh, the total cap? I heard a maximum of four. Was that the oh, intent? Uh, okay. Only four for examination duties. Well, then, of course, you have the, the, the other question to, to the cap is, okay, I do the test, but I also do a workshop. So do I get four and four, or we just cap it at four? Oh, I thought we were talking about capping it at four okay, total. Cool. Okay. I just want to be clear because those are two very different, mm -hmm. two, two very different things. Mm -hmm. And and some participate in both and often, and some only do maybe one event for us a year. Um, mm -hmm. So it really does depend on the licensee. So. Okay. Yeah, four per day is, is a big chunk of of their annual. So I I'm a little uncomfortable with that. I think it should cap at four. Cap at four. I agree. I would agree. Uh, just a total of four. As a cap. Total of four, and then two two hours of credit per day of service. Is that so? We'd be right. two hours per day of service with a maximum of four, four allowed for examination purposes. Yeah, per year. Yeah, renewal cycle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah year. Yeah. <laughs> In this case. Yeah. Or per your um, renewal period would prob might be more appropriate since everyone's quote unquote year is very different. Mm -hmm. So per renewal period. Yes. Okay. So we're going to have her read that back so we... So let me go ahead and give this one a shot. So if a licensee serves the board as a selected participant in board-sponsored examination development or examination administration-related functions, the licensee may receive up to two hours for each day of service with a maximum of four hours per renewal period of continuing education credit, and then you would strike out the last part for each day of service. So it would say two hours for each day of service with a maximum of four hours per renewal period of continuing education service. Credit, sorry. I think at that point, we would wanna go ahead and potentially remove the next line because we're saying you can you can get up to four, so that's two different times. So you don't really have to say only once per renewal period because it's no longer you're getting all four for the day. So I think that next sentence of the licensee may claim credit for examination development or administration related functions once per renewal period, I think that can be removed because we're giving it a maximum cap. Yeah, it becomes redundant unless legally there's something that we need to have that in. That kind of is a sort of redundant statement. I think so. Um, you know, just to level set as well, we have uh, Karen Halbo here, who is your regulations counsel. So if you have questions specific to the regulations, we'll, we'll address those to her and she can come up. Uh, Karen, come on down. <laughs> Nope. The button on the mic, yeah. It's been two years. No worries. <laughs> I don't think there's any problem removing that sentence, and Sharice was correct. And having it repeat there is not helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, 
Are there any other concerns from a regulatory standpoint? No. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, then let's move to the next section that we talked about, which was updating what course content is allowable. So essentially what we're putting in here is allowing continuing education that deals with hearing aid, the devices, to count towards CEUs, which historically they did at one point and then that was pulled back. And now we're looking to at least add some of it back in that is actually germane to what is going to um, assist the public. My feeling on this has been that scope of practice for a hearing aid dispenser is dispensing hearing aids. So to not be able to have continuing education on the dispensing of hearing aids to me just kind of seems counterproductive, you know. Um, so it, uh, there are certainly courses that I think are too basic as you listed and aren't um, necessarily focused on hearing aids that I think are inappropriate, but those courses that are dealing specifically with programming troubleshooting, actually the functionality of the hearing aid that would benefit the consumer by that person having more knowledge, um, programming the hearing aid I think is reasonable and understandable. You had a question concerning that? No, I understand the point you're making and that sometimes it's hard to find courses and so on that meet these. But historically, I remember when this came to be, and it came to be because the courses are always, nearly always, probably 95% offered by manufacturers. Mm -hmm. They are sales um, endeavors mm -hmm. to get dispensers and dispensing audiologists to dispense their product. That's their goal. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure that if we allow this the, the way it's written, that that isn't just going to lead to an influx of those manufacturers being back on the beat, um, trying to do that again. Now we can tell them um, th this this is the rule. Okay, you can't be telling us how to market, how to do other things that to, to make money off this, this these products, and they would probably tailor their their um, workshops accordingly. But there, there aren't just like regular folks out there are going to put on workshops about this um, that aren't manufacturers. So mm -hmm. let's not be naive about how that's going to go. Um, and I, and I, I don't disagree. Um, but there has been a lot of changes. I mean, back in the day when they were, they were three-hour classes, they'd give you lunch. They had all this time to get the, uh, to get the continuing education. Uh, in my experience doing these courses on audiology online, uh, as an example, with them distilled down to an hour, they really don't have time to spend on extraneous things. Um, and it's more focused on the product itself. The reality is it is going to come from manufacturers because their trainers are the experts. And do, you want, do they want you to buy their hearing aids? Yes, of course they do. But I don't think that necessarily then takes away from the information we're getting in order to better be able to program their hearing instruments or understand ways to troubleshoot them, new software that comes out to be able to program them as new product comes out. That's all critical information for us to have. And yeah, they clearly want you to buy their hearing aids. That's why they're doing it. That's why they're giving you the information. But I don't think one necessarily completely abrogates the other. And I think this will go back to a lot more of staff reviewing these. So, um, you know, they submit the course, they submit the outline, they submit the descriptions and what they're going to be talking about. And, and staff's going to have to scrutinize this really carefully. Um, we've, we've got a good history of reminding them because people still, under the current rules, send in product-focused items, um, business-related items that we have to tease out and say, I'm sorry, your, your coursework can't be approved because it's this focus, it's that focus, and those are outside the scope. So it really does, it will put the onus on staff to be reviewing these to make sure when we see things that look like marketing, demonstration, promo, it, it's got to all go. Um, but that would be the caveat is, of course, it's going to have to get teased out in the implementation. Let me 
just address that. Um, uh, I, I totally understand what Todd is saying. That's it's a reasonable argument about this, especially for dispensers. Um, and we can create this carve out where, where we're not allowing the marketing piece. But what you can't control is they'll do the workshop, they'll comply with what you want, but they're going to hand us handouts that show us how to market it. Oh, and then gotcha. their marketing people are going to send us an email the next week. Thank you for attending this. Here's some marketing material on this. I don't know how you control that. Mm. Well, honestly, I haven't seen that. Well, we haven't seen it in a long time, but I used well, to. No, I mean, I, I do classes now, even though I'm not getting CEU credit for it. I do classes now online all the time because they've got new product coming out. I want to know how to program it because if someone walks into my office with a hearing device and I don't fit that regularly, I want to be able to have an understanding of how to program it because nowadays programming software isn't as similar from one to the other. They can be very different. Mm -hmm. I have, in all honesty, in all the courses I've taken, I've never had a single piece of marketing material given to me. I've never had a follow-up phone call from anyone. Is it possible? As yeah, it's possible. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, as a, as a participant in the class. I mean, I get marketing materials weekly. Yeah, <laughs> right. Without workshops. Exactly, and, and that's my point. Is we're getting that stuff anyway. Taking the class doesn't necessarily generate more of that. Oh, I, mean, I disagree. I, I get, well. Uh, I mean, it's been a long time. We, this has been in effect for quite a while. But I remember clearly going to, to these uh, workshops and getting not only the take-home packet of information for marketing, but contact. They know you were there. You have to sign in and sign out. Uh, they, they, your email is there. They know how to contact you, and they will send you marketing. That's my experience. Well, they're not actually doing them in person anymore, though. It's all online through, say, Audiology Online. Perhaps. And that maybe that's the buffer, and maybe that's why I haven't gotten it. I don't know. But they don't do person-to-person -person, um, training any longer. They haven't done that actually for a number of years, well before COVID. And yes? Oh, just when, okay. when you're ready. And um, so we don't, there is no table to where you take marketing materials. It, it's all because we're separated. I'm sitting in my office or at home. They're where they are. We just, we do the class, we log off and take the test. It'll continue that way, but there is the possibility that they'll come back to face to face. Yeah. Go ahead yeah. and let Paul, and then I'll have something after Paul. I just wanted to mention that I, I think our goal here is to identify what is acceptable for continuing education requirements and what the course content can and cannot contain. And I think, I think we're, we're attempting to do that by saying that what is not acceptable is further down, we talk about what has to do with the marketing and some of the other areas that are just trying to sell a particular hearing aid. I don't think we're gonna be able to control uh, the post-marketing that might happen. I think it's very realistic that if they have your contact information, they're gonna try to send you post-marketing materials, but I just don't think we're gonna be able to address that here. But we also have to make it clear that if they're gonna hold workshops of any sort, especially face-to-face, that they not provide that kind of material at that event. And that's where I'm wondering if that belongs inside of, of B2. Um, so prohibiting the content and the distribution of materials for that purpose. Yeah. That, so that it's, it's saying you, yeah. can't, you can't teach on this and you can't distribute materials about this. Right. And right. that way we kind of hit right. both with yep. one whack. Yep. And again, if we, then if we hear reports of providers doing that, we can address it the next time we see one of their courses. Right. You know, we're hearing reports of this, you know, maybe we, I mean, maybe it becomes a point where we can not approve their courses if they're not willing to follow the rules. Right. Um, and maybe that's how we address it here. So it's not just about course content, but also about materials distributed. So it could maybe be, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm thinking it on the fly here, so uh, roll with me, um, but course content. Well, let me think of this. Give me two seconds. My brain will, will go Amy, for did it. you have any? Um... Uh, well, I, um, I find the way this is written very confusing. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, this whole topic is very difficult to manage, and I think trying to understand how we can 
control it. Um, when you do go to any sort of manufacturer sponsored training, even though all of the, you know, yes, I need to know how this feature works and that feature works and how to program it, it's always peppered with XYZ device is so much better than competitors XYZ device because of yada yada features that we have. So th there is always an element of marketing no, no matter what, even if the focus of the event is on learning how to use the software, learning how to program it best for your patient's needs, um, et cetera. Um, and so how to tease that out or how to expect staff to be able to tease all of it out, I, I guess, based on, on how the event is presented mm -hmm. um, on, on paper. Um, but understanding, as Marcia is indicating, you know, it's always, there's always going to be that element, you know, oh, come and if you come to this one, you can buy six devices for the price of four and get your BOGOs and all of the other things that happen at those events is, is very, very common. And I, I understand the dilemma, and I think limiting, you know, especially dispensers, but also dispensing audiologists from being able to attend um, educational opportunities because of there's some launch of a product, which is when the manufacturers hold these <laughs> opportunities usually, um, is a challenge. So I, I, the way, even the way it's written here, you know, how, how, do, how that's interpreted, or myself as a licensee, how do I know, well, gosh, is this really going to cross the line or not, and how to tell in advance? Um, uh, in advance, they should actually be saying it's a board-approved course. So they're yeah. supposed to get approval of the course prior to delivering it. Right. So that would be the first one for licensees' purposes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if we approve it, that's where you're at, is the licensee who's taking it, right? Yeah. Um, the harder part is going to be on, on, you know, our staff operationalizing it and taking a look at these things. I think we can use some of the... The prior ones, people that obviously did not read the laws and regs and went ahead and submitted the course anyways, um, and that was, they're, they're about marketing and, and devices. And so we can look at that. Um, the harder part might be is kind of figuring out um, how do we audit it? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we do periodic attendance? Just like you're supposed to audit um, on the speech language pathology and audiology side. You're supposed to audit the course um, providers every now and again to take a look at, are they actually providing the level of content they say they are? Um, so is there a way to develop that? And I, I think there could be. Um, I just don't know that it's in this. It's not right now in the course content regulation, um, but that could be something we look at, the potential for doing that um, and making this part of the package. I think ultimately it comes down to, is the core information appropriate? Yeah whatever marketing they may or may not do. And that's really the difference between um, online CEUs versus in person. They're, you're, you're far more likely to get that in person than you are online. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever, however they couch it, if the information is important and it's viable information, then it's viable information. You know, we're adults. We understand that they're going to market to us. But if I go in and I want, I'm looking for specific information that's going to help me with the consumer and I get that, then I think it's a valuable course. You know, and without having to necessarily spend $1,000 to get the CEUs that I need. We talk a lot about barriers to, you know, um, to, to, the, to the provider and being able to do their work. That's a pretty big barrier when I have to basically spend a grand just to get my CEUs because I have to go somewhere to get it because I can't get it online because those same courses are not offered live. So, you know, my, one of my goals here is to be able to extend what offerings there are so dispensers don't have such a barrier to get their hours every year mm -hmm. and to have actual meaningful courses. So I get an hour learning about the history of artificial intelligence, but I don't get an hour for learning how to troubleshoot um, a hearing aid that may be the difference between someone having a successful experience or not. You know, to me, that's just wrong. It, is there any discussion here related to a maximum number of hours that are getting, that are received by going to a manufacturer-based training, sim similar to... Well, they have, um, I don't know 
there is there is we do speak to the number of hours that can be um, used for um, non-related versus related um, but that's certainly something that you know we could potentially look at you know as a way to try to um, trim it in in 1399.140 when we're talking about continuing education required that's where we limit the amount of related or indirect care courses. It's also where we cap self-study. Um, so there is the opportunity to say that as well. So if, if it was deemed um, necessary and to ensure that you're, you're getting appropriate continuing education, maybe a certain number of hours is the maximum you can get in product focused or um, equipment devices or other product related coursework. The, the difficulty is, again, we're trying to do the best to set the standards here, but uh, over your lifetime as a hearing aid dispenser or dispensing audiologist, obviously it's gonna change a lot, right? So we're trying to make the basis for everyone. Um, but of course, I mean, some of those other courses may have been really handy when you first start out, but now that you're, you've been around a long time, you know, you are looking for more product focused stuff because you've already hit all the basic care, all the basic direct client care items. Um, you've updated yourself on those issues more often. Um, but now you're looking at how do I, how do I best do my job and, and troubleshoot these things? Um, so there is the option there. That is one way the committee could go is, yes, we're gonna start allowing this, this product focus as long as it's not marketing. Um, but also we're going to limit it just like we do indirect or related care. So that's also an option. Again, remembering you only have 12 hours, so. Yeah, well, and yeah. so that we don't create such a convoluted formula, I need to have a calculator and understand trigonometry to figure out how many hours of the 12 of this and how many of that. And, you know, I mean, I would like to keep it as relatively straightforward as, as possible and not have multiple carve-outs. I think the carve-outs for the marketing materials and all that makes perfect sense. You know, any course that starts with the word introduction, you know, pretty much wouldn't be, because that's introducing a new product. Again, that's basically a sales meeting, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, there are certainly, you know, ways, you know, we can look at that if we want to drill down even more. Well, in some of these things, again, it's how the board staff operationalize the regulation. So, um, you can be as specific as you want, um, or you, you can direct staff to work with subject matter experts to really drill down and kind of figure out a way, the best way to operationalize these items. Well, I think though, unless you get a couple of dispensing audiologists and uh, hearing aid dispensers on your staff to help go through, go through these things, I think we need to keep it relatively, you know, straightforward. Currently, as it happens, when we get one that might confound us, it's usually going to go up to me and then it might go to a subject matter expert. So we do use our senior examiners and our examiners to be kind of a sounding board, especially when it relates to something staff wouldn't wouldn't understand. So I have a question. Can I just say something, Todd, here? I, I want to echo what, what Todd is saying about making this um, as clear as possible for licensees um, we've had to come up with job aids on our website to explain all the formulas that currently exist for speech language pathologists and audiologists, dual holders, audiologists with dispensing licenses. And when I go out and talk to groups, that's one of the most confusing things for them to understand. I actually have people in the audience that ask me the same question. Those individuals ask me the same question every time I go because it can be rather confusing. So. I think the focus here is whether this is approved course content or not, and we should try to keep it as simple as possible to try to avoid all the different extrapolations. Yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my one concern about having multiple carve-outs. I just have a quick question. Um, if it wasn't for the actual companies that are doing these um, uh, courses, who, who, else would, who else would do it? Would it be like a local university or? Who actually gives the courses? <laughs> yeah. If it's, a, if it's on a product, it's going to be by a manufacturer. Okay. Yeah, because every hearing aid is 
specific to that exact product, yeah. right? Right, and their programs all, programs are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there may be an independent, like a Lowell or something like that company that might know that. I don't know of anyone. I've never seen in all my years someone doing, have you seen it other than the manufacturer doing a, um, a product? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's kind of like we have no choice but yeah. to use these. Okay. You're right. And intrinsically, it is at the root of it. They're it trying to is, show you how great yeah. the product is. And they are so you'll marketing. Buy it. Yeah, and they are marketing about yeah. it. But there's no, there's, right now, there's nothing we can go around it. Right. But I, speaking to Amy's point, you know, making sure it's written in such a way that, and uh, what uh, Marsh was also saying, written in such a way that, you know, they can't talk about, you know, sales or promotions of their product. You know, they stick strictly to, you know, product information mm -hmm. and and not spend time discussing promos or anything of that nature because that's totally inappropriate. Right. You know, then, and then they give yeah. you, but so you, then they end up, but they end up giving you those promos um, later on in an email well, or something like get a two for one. Honestly, again, I've never off. seen it. Okay. I mean, I guess it's possible, but I have not, and I'm, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Right. But I honestly have never seen it mm -hmm. um, happen. Okay. Uh, not not in the form it is now, where I go on to Audiology Online, mm -hmm. and I would say, and if the uh, there's someone from Audiology Online out there listening in, they can um, correct me. But a vast majority of the credit hours that are um, that are used or gotten in, is through a, something like Audiology Online. Okay. Uh, there are certainly people go to HHP and CAA, but there's a lot, a lot of people who get their hours strictly through audiology online in one hour increments as opposed to whole day. Right. I mean, I, I think if we if we think about historically why why this was initially eliminated as an option was at the time where ethically things were still happening, where we could go on a cruise with a manufacturer and take two days or three days of classes on the cruise boat and, and whatever location and knock out all your educational requirements by doing that. And, and I think that's where the heart of this came from back when the change was made. You know, since that time, things have significantly changed in the field in general, um, and those aren't ethically something that is, is allowable by most of our national organizations and things like that anymore. So I, I, I do agree, Todd, I, I see where things have changed. That's just not an acceptable practice anymore. Um, and so having, so having you know, that carve out completely um, maybe doesn't make sense anymore. But at the heart of it, right, what we're trying to do is make sure that consumers are, are being treated properly because their professionals are educated properly in the devices that they're using and in best practice techniques and keeping up with current techniques, right? So I think we wanna avoid letting people go and get 100% of their education from a manufacturer, because I don't think that that is probably a wide enough view um, for, for people to be exposed to practices. Um, but, you know, I, I agree. I think eliminating all of this is, is also no longer necessary. So do we at least agree or not agree with the basic premise that we need to be able to allow, manuf um, well, as it says, content on the fitting, programming, and troubleshooting of equipment, devices, and other products of a particular manufacturer or company. Do we agree that at least at its, at its basic principle, that is something that needs to be brought back into the fold? I do, I agree with that. Yeah, can I just okay. ask a question though? I don't take audiology online courses, but are most of those provided by manufacturers also? I mean, well, actually I it's a wide variety, they've got, um, hospitals, they have research audiologists that give courses, they have um, uh, a lot, lots of different um, organizations give um, courses on audiology online. Mm -hmm. The ones that are involved with product are going to be by whatever manufacturer that is. Okay, so that it but there is a huge range of, um, of providers. I would say, well, I don't want to hazard a guess, but uh, there, there's a significant number of people outside of the manufacturer realm that do courses. Yeah, no, I know. I just yeah. was saying the hearing aid related courses are right. primarily put on by manufacturers. Those are going to primarily be put on manufacturers because they are the subject matter experts for their own, their own device. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there uh, any further comment in the room? 
concerning this section, we can move forward. We just have a little bit more to cover. Um, so what we didn't go over was 1399.144. And so this is about exemptions from continuing education, and these are um, essentially bringing you into conformance so that it's similar to the speech language pathology and audiology side so that it's more spelled out um, so that you have to submit the written ex uh, request for exemption. There's um, for at least one year of the prior, um, for at least one year during the licensee's previous license renewal period, the licensee was absent from California for military service. Um, they resided in another country, so they were out of the country. Um, or during the licensee's um, previous renewal period, the licensee was in, or their immediate family member were um, suffering or suffered a disability that's physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of an individual. Disability shall be verified by a licensed physician or psychologist. Um, and it just asks you know, them to provide with the, to the board the nature and extent of the disability, an explanation of how it hinders the licensee from completing continuing education, and then provides kind of their professional, um, you know, their name, license number, and how to contact them if there was questions. Um, this just kind of brings you in similarly with the speech language pathology and audiology side. The one thing um, is that, of course, it's, it's based on the one year, and that other side is on a two-year renewal cycle. So that is a little different. So it would be using the one-year mark is saying that you were disabled for the whole year, or you were a caretaker for someone that was fully disabled for a whole year. Um, and that's currently, right now, it's just uh, the broader language, which is the board and its discretion may exempt the continuing, continuing education new renewal requirements for health, military service, or undue hardship. So, and we, we don't get that many of these requests. Um, so, this language is set forth just to kind of bring parity. So, it just brings us in line with, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's the language from the other side, so. Any uh, questions or comments from the board on that? Okay. Now, and then previously at the last meeting, uh, we were requested, staff was requested to provide the committee with the other state's requirements for hearing aid dispensers. So that's your other attachment in there. Um, so that provides you with information on what other states are allowing or not allowing. And then there was also the question about summary of denied continuing education courses. And so we put together a list, uh, staff did. And then a lot of them you'll see are uh, business focus, some are about marketing, uh, outside of the scope, um, and then a whole list of product focused ones. It's a free <laughs> trial one. Is that kind of like a coupon? <laughs> Is that more like marketing free trial? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The the first page, the third one, it says free trials. Identify patients for free trial. Describe free trial program. <clears throat> it's a summary of denied. Yeah. Oh, these are the denied continuing education. Yeah, they're denied. Okay. These are all denied courses. So they okay. were too business focused about yeah how to provide clients with mm -hmm. free trials and keep them. So you'll see sometimes it's business focused, sometimes it's marketing. Uh, some are very broad. Some are very business related. What was it? Um, oh, what was it? Was it about unbundling? I think it was. Yeah, there was an unbundling one. Yeah. So while some of these might be interesting, they, they don't meet the requirements in the what the course content cannot do, so staff have uh, denied them. Um, and so I think that, that was kind of the, cure, the pleasure of the committee to go ahead and ask, like, what are we seeing in denials? And of course, yeah, it's all over the board, and some obviously um, did not review the regulations and went ahead and submitted that course anyway. But. Uh, just as a side note, um, 
for the state's permitting hearing aid for the CE requirements for number five, Arizona, they actually do have no more than eight hours on current on business or client service practices or trends in the profession. So would that be similar to what we were discussing about the programming fitting? Uh, it, it's on the last number five, Arizona. If you see it, no more than eight hours on current on business. Well, yeah. that's actually stuff that we wouldn't allow, I think. Oh, right. no, no. Yeah. No more than eight hours sponsored by a single manufacturer. Right. I see. So no more than eight hours <clears throat> current on business or client service practices, which we don't. Okay. Yeah. We don't okay. allow. And then how but, about yes. And then we don't allow that um, sponsored by a single manufacturer, right? Yeah. Currently, we don't allow that. So if we right. were okay. allow them to do them, there is that opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, we could theoretically break it. I, I, I don't want to make it more complicated more. than more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So saying it just gets to be yeah, so complicated that. Yeah. It's hard to follow. Yeah. I, I would think that I'm a simple man. I like simple, <laughs> easy to read, yeah. large block letters. <laughs> I, I think that's where, you know, you, you end up right back at, at 1399.140 and the maybe we should. And, and what, the, what is that number? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Should, um, for simplicity's sake, should number one be credited in related, indirect, or by a single man. I mean, like oh, you lump it all into no one more and than say X number of hours per manufacturer. You could do that. You could. You could even say just like this is. There's. You can allow these things that are not direct care, and they're not about the product, and that's where you'd get the bulk of your hours. That's essentially what's going on right now. Is it has to be mm -hmm, direct, mm -hmm. and it can't be by a manufacturer, and that can be nine of your 12 hours. That has to be nine of your 12 hours, right? Okay. And they're saying we're limiting indirect and related. The hard part is, is by our definitions, we're saying direct care includes the um, programming, the content on, yeah, on fitting programming. So you kind of almost would need a separate one that says, you know, manufacturer sponsored courses, some sort of limitation maybe on that and makes it very simple. Um, well, each each manufacturer will have like their own course, and it'd be like an hour or two. But each hearing aid dispenser, how many how many brands do you carry? Right. It, depends on uh, it depends <clears throat> on the dispenser or dispensing audiologist. So, I mean, most have a tendency to limit it to two or three. Okay. Just for simplicity's sake, but. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to have knowledge of a multitude of them because yeah. who knows what's going to walk through through your door. Um, you know, the issue with limiting the number of hours to a manufacturer, well, okay, but then if I only fit, say, two manufacturers and I can only get two hours on those two manufacturers, then I have to spend time, you know, with other manufacturers, mm -hmm. you know, which product I may or may not fit. I mean, there there's... There's pros and cons to go back and forth on this. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm on, just... either direction. Quite honestly, um, you can make a case for both. Mm -hmm. um, it really just comes down to: Do we want to simplify it as much as possible so, you know, Paul doesn't have to have these discussions 27 times a year? Um, you know, how, just how much into the weeds do we do we want to get? Right. Well, I do think simple is important, but it's also important to make sure that people are getting the amount of education they should be getting, and we're not allowing someone to go off on a vacation trip and get all their units with one manufacturer. Yeah, so absolutely, it's important. I think bringing up how Arizona is doing it, it maybe is a little easier to carve out when you only have people renewing every other year. So they're, you know, they have a little more. <laughs> Oh. Time, you know, it's easier to carve all those units out. When we're doing it in a 12-month cycle, it's it's a little harder because it's so many fewer units. Right. We're only doing 12 every every 12 months. Might make it more challenging. So. Well, the other issue too is Arizona allows for any IHS course mm -hmm. you get credit for, which is an international hearing society. So if I know it's it's an IHS course I can work, then I can figure those hours out a lot easier because I basically have what's one-stop shopping for my continuing ed hours. So. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other wrinkle. I think we mostly just need to decide, do we want only so many hours for a manufacturer um, or for hearing aid, um, continuing at hours versus others? 
you know, and how many of that is. And then if we want to take that number and break it down a second time to how much per manufacturer, you know, we can, we can look at that, I guess, as well. You know, in the end, I can't, I can't help but keep going back to, you know, thinking in our own sunset review, it says hearing aid dispensers are response to the scope of practice is dispensing hearing aids. Okay, well, if that's my scope of practice, then why is it my continuing ed hours follow my scope of practice? You know, in my mind, the majority of my hours should be within my scope of practice, not, not you know, ancillary topics that don't necessarily have anything to do with me dispensing and fitting hearing aids. But, you know, understanding the concerns that everyone has about, um, you know, loading up on one particular topic, you know, then I think it's reasonable to have a carve out and say this many hours for hearing aid dispensing. Because we can always come back a couple of years from now once this thing happens, we can always come back and look at it and say, okay, is it working? Is it not working? Right? And we can do adjustments, you know, accordingly. I, I would just say that it's not the entire scope of the practice to fit the hearing aid, right? I mean, you have to test the hearing, you have to validate and verify the hearing aid. So there are multiple other tasks involved with the fitting hearing aid. So just knowing the hearing aid programming is not, you know, 100% of what a dispenser is doing. True. They just don't necessarily have uh, continuing ed courses on any of that other stuff. Mm. They do have some on like real air measurement, but they don't necessarily have courses on, you know, audiometers and things like that. Not that I've seen, but you know, that in itself is a marketing thing because <laughs> they're trying to get me to buy their audiometers. So we can go down the rabbit hole on that one as well. You know, it looks to me like hearing it's are moving in a more sophisticated direction in terms of programming and a chip operation in the hearing aids. Um, and it's using a lot of neuroscience aspects to, to do those things. Neural networks, artificial intelligence, all that. Mm -hmm. So to say, well, yes, that isn't step one through 10 to fit this hearing aid, it's still irrelevant for all dispensers to understand the operation of, of the chip um, uh, and the software. So I think there's appropriate courses in there um, that would behoove your understanding and thus make you a better dispenser. Shall we uh, call for a comment? Nice. In, in, in the room here with us, is there anyone who'd like to comment on this uh, or any of the uh, subjects that we've uh, covered so far? Nope. Uh, shall we call for comment on uh, WebEx? We are now open for public comment on this matter in WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star 3 to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. I saw a hand flash up and down. Um, we have a request from April, April Dolan. Bear with me just a moment, please, and I will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, hi. Um, I'm April Dolan. I'm the Continuing Education Administrator for Audiology Online, as well as a licensed audiologist in the state of Texas. Um, and I know audiology online was kind of thrown around during that discussion a few times, and I just wanted to make myself available to answer any questions. Thank you. Seeing no other requests for comments, do you wish to close comments at this time? If we can also um, request comment for our other remote site, if there's anyone that happened to uh, show up there. Ms. Hilda? No, no one um, from the public is here. Thank you. Let's go ahead and close the comments in.
need the uh, materials. So, so okay, that so, mm, so. Right. Um, so do we want to um, go forward with the staff recommendation language as is, or do we want to send it back for another um, another pass with some of the other um, suggestions that we have made concerning the carve outs? Well, we can take the we can take the changes that we've made today since it's a recommendation and present that to the board. Okay, that's my understanding, right? The changes that we we've, we've, we've discussed that we've reached consensus on, we can take those forward, right? Well, if we're talking about um, um, making a motion to to recommend the language to the full board, yes, that could include the the changes that were made today, as amended. Correct. Okay. Okay. Did we have clarification on whether we were limiting the equipment device or product content like a number of hours or did we not? Because I don't have any notes on that. I think it was just a discussion and I think it was just a discussion about about it, but not not any decision. Okay. Not any good. language per se. Yeah, I think I think we can just I don't know, keep it open for now and then see. Mm -hmm. What happened? That's something that we could then discuss uh, uh, with the full board. Okay. Or, yeah. or keep it open for now and then see what happens yeah. when this is implemented and see what's, you know. Well, what I think we have to have the full board approval. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We, can, we can leave it open as yeah. what not carving out a specific number for the carve outs, and then that would allow the full board a chance to. Uh, Agreed. To weigh in, and then we can, you know, go back and if we need to change it, could we then change it at that time? Okay. Would that be uh, acceptable, legally speaking? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. I believe there was hanging that she was looking at yes. for uh, subdivision B, talking about what is outside the scope. That for the second one, course content or distribution of materials. Focused on blah blah blah. Was that yeah. you were working on it? But I didn't and, and that's know where I wasn't sure if we wanted to just simply include or materials distributed, or if we should add a second sentence that said this includes the distribution of materials during the course or after the course. So that way, it's saying the prohibition in the first sentence regarding marketing, launching, and demonstrating the marketability of equipment that includes materials distributed at or after. I don't know if we can get away with after, but um, that would kind of hit the point of like, you, you're you not supposed to, like you're not supposed to use this as an opportunity right. to send more marketing material to your course participants. I think that hits it. Okay. So that's clear. Yeah. yeah. And now it's been read into the record. If you're saying as amended, she has that clearly there. Yes. Todd, I just have one question. Um, when you go to these, when you do these courses, um, either don't they give you, they don't give you like some type of booklet that gives you like a step-by-step -step so you, after the course, you can go back and take home, right? And take back to your office and take a look at it and review it, right? Yeah, because you typically they're going to give you uh, the PowerPoint slides. How, yeah. That PowerPoint has the, slides. The, what, they, what they discussed in the steps, yes. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that that is not included in B2. Right. So it, it, you know, I don't want, I don't want market, marketing material. Yeah. I don't want the manufacturer the to not give anything back to the students. When not. I just ask, maybe Michael knows, um, when you try to restrict a manufacturer uh, from marketing their materials, is there any restraint of trade issue with that? I think that's something we'd probably need to take a look at on a case by case basis. Um, in, in terms of commercial speech, perhaps. Um, but in the regulatory context, you, what you need to be able to show is that there is, is a basis for the requirement, that, that, that there's some necessity in terms, of, uh, in terms of promulgating the regulation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So then we need a motion to accept the the language as amended to be presented to the board. 
I motion to um, accept the language as amended. Is that okay? Motion right now. Can we, can we do that? I think and, and to recommend it to the full board. And to recommend the full board. Second. Okay. Call the roll. Marsha. Aye. Uh, we do need to take public comment. Oh, you're right. Yes. Let's, uh, let's open it up for public comment before we vote. Good. Anyone here uh, with us in the room? So let's open up to the WebEx, please. We are now open for public comment on WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests for public comment. And our first request for comment comes from April Dolan. Bear with me just a moment and I will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, um, so I guess as um, the CE administrator for audiology online um, with the language as amended, um, I'm wondering if there would be any sort of grace period while we're trying to figure out exactly where that line is, um, because at this point, submitting courses um, for $50 per submission, it it's kind of a, it's a financial hit to us to submit things if we're not entirely sure that it's going to be approved. So I'm just hoping that there would be either a grace period or some more specific language about what exactly is allowed and what isn't. Um, just from that standpoint. Thank you. Seeing no other requests on WebEx, do you wish to move to uh, Gilda? Please. Well, there is no one else present with me for public comment. Thank you. Cherise, did you have a comment? Yeah, so, um, I think it's important to think about um, these are course approval um, applications. So if there is something that can be fixed as a deficiency, that could be one way to do that um, so that we continue to work with providers. Um, I don't know that it would be um, like a checklist they can they can look at and don't include this language. I don't, I don't think it'd be that simple, but um, Currently, I'm not quite sure what a grace period does if this opens up the table or opportunities more than it does, because it's not like we're going to take away of take away the ability to do something. We're adding the ability to do something. So I'm Correct. I'm just a little confused on the grace period. So. Well, I think it's also incumbent on us to make sure the language is very specific oh. and clear, so there is you know, it's, it's, they're they're able to read it and tell what we're talking about. And if not, then, then we should continue to work on it and flesh it out. And I'll have a, an opportunity to comment further when it goes before the full board as well. Okay. The time it's gonna take this package to get <laughs> where it's going, <laughs> there'll be plenty of time. Okay, if there's no further comment, um, we have the motion seconded. Uh, call the roll. Were you going to check Gilda's site? She said there was okay. no one there. Thank yeah. you. We, we did that before you guys called. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, myself, Todd Borges, aye. Marsha Rajo. Aye. Karen Chang. Aye. Amy White. Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you. Okay, we have one other item to go over in our binders, HAD4. Discussion and possible action regarding examination requirements for hearing aid dispensers and dispensing audiologists, as stated in Title 16, CCR Sections 1399.120. Point one two one and point one two two. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Borges. Um, Bray here with your regulations on um, 
exam requirements for hearing aid dispensers and dispensing audiologists. This is a combination of two board of previously board approved languages that has been amended to include changes that we've identified as well as our legal counsel and now requires review and approval. This regulation will align, um, align our regulations with current hearing aid dispensing exam process as well as streamline the licensure for dispensing audiologists um, who have demonstrated extensive uh, clinical and professional training. In 2018, the board requested DCA to uh, conduct an occupational analysis on the audiology practice in California in accordance to Business and Profession Code 2539.1. At the May 2008 meeting, uh, DCA presented the, their report. Um, the information included the analysis of the examination requirement for dispensing audiologists, and based on this analysis, DCA determined that the um, that audiologists wishing to dispense hearing aids should not have to take hearing aid dispensers practical examination and recommended that the board evaluate whether the practical examination was creating an unnecessary barrier to licensure. At its August 2008 meeting, the board evaluated the current exam requirements and consider whether a different examination should be administered um, or if the current examinations are appropriate based on the information provided. Um, board approved motion to accept the recommendation to remove the practical examinations for dispensing audiologists and directed staff to work with legal and drafting regulations language. Um, due to COVID um, staff or resources, the regulatory package was delayed. On uh, July 29, 2021, board staff submitted and adopted proposed text to DCA prior to initiating the preview group process. Um, in that in that preview process, the D, uh, DCA legal identified changes to the regulatory um, to the language, um, in particular for dispensing audiologists, and identifying a lack, uh, it lacked clarity for um, when it came to the examination. Our current examinations regulations lack clarity clarity in what a written examination was. Um, or when it comes when you're looking at practical exam, there was uh, extensive language on practical exam, but nothing on the brain exam. Um, so it it proved a clarity issues when needing to refer to regulations which exam dispensers had it to you had to use. Um, so this, as I mentioned, is a combination of two uh, language. Uh, the board had previously looked at making changes to the examination language. And so we took it a little further to um, make it more clear to the public what the, the current process, as well as include regulations of the process of the written exam. That way we can move ahead with removing the practical examinations for dispensing audiologists. Are there any questions on the information presented? Um, I can also go, um, through each section on the proposed text and explain, provide a basis for the changes as well. I just had one question on the on page one of eight um, out of the proposed regulatory language. Um, uh, 1399.120B, uh, I think it's B, so far down here. It says that you're only going to allow a certain number of examinees to take it at any particular time and that um, applications will return to all those who are not in the first maximum number. And it doesn't say anything about returning their money. Have they paid at that point or not? No, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. We don't process payment for the practical examination until you actually know you're gonna be allowed in. So okay. we, that, that gets returned to them. Okay. And just to add a little more clarity here, um, we put in the provisions about based um, the number of applicants 
is based on health and safety considerations and the availability of examination space and examiners, um, because that's really been the biggest thing. Is um, are we, are we even allowed to hold an examination due to safety protocols during the pandemic? And then once we were availability of examiners and space um, that was appropriate, that became the bigger consideration. So. Um, 50 is kind of a big number when we're we're so limited, but we are trying to do as many exams as we can, and we're trying to work at new and innovative ways to get as many people through as we can and get closer to 50. But the whole um, previous restriction of 50 was a, just a, a number thrown out there, and at least this gives us the criteria that if we ever have additional space and more examiners, we could move up. Um, if health and safety requirements change, it can go back down. So it, it gives us a lot more ability to address it. This also gives us flexibility. We have a current model of the way we have conducted examinations. Examiners, those of you that have done an exam have come to this building and we had one large event you know, on a Saturday. So this gives us flexibility to have as many exams as we want and determine what the maximum allowable is based on our based on what we can do. May I ask a question? Um, re just reviewing this language, it, it, it previously said the first 50. Um, and what I don't see here is what do you do if you have more than the maximum number? How do you determine who takes the exam? Did you want to address that, Sharice, or did you want me to? I believe in there it says applications in the order received. So that's how we determine who um, takes the exam. And um, we're removing 50 so that we can determine what number the exam, depending on the number of examiners we can have, if another pandemic, you know, pandemic creates quarantine where we have to create more space and limit the number of participants. So, um, so yeah, so in the, I think towards the end, it explains what the number, how that determines. Right, and the current process is so limiting that if you're, if, if you're not at the front of the line and you're not part of those 50, according to the regulation, we automatically send everything right back and then you have to get in line again. So we actually are trying to, we actually try to accommodate, accommodate those people by holding another exam. So, we're trying to make a, a process that is flexible enough so that we can continue having the exam. It's not limiting, not, it's actually uh, allowing for more, it's more permissive. Yeah, I, I see that there. My, my concern was if you, if you had um, a space of 20, 20 uh, exam slots and you got 40 applications, how you did, but I, it does seem to still include that language about the order that in, the, in which they're received. So, yeah, so opposed to taking yeah, those 20 you. and sending them back, now we're just saying, okay, now Sharice or the administrator has the flexibility to say, I'm gonna take these 20 and put them in the next exam, which could be next Thursday or next Friday, instead of going through the whole process of making them reapply. And so just as a random, you know, we'll give you a little closer window into the operations. Uh, we, we actually, when we open the filing period, we number it, we put the time it was received, and it goes in that order outside of, of course, legal requirements. So if there's a legal requirement for uh, military to go first, they, they would get that. Um, so we, we try to honor that process there. So first come, first serve. So. Um, usually on filing day, there are people ready to come hop into our lobby <laughs> at 8 a.m. Um, because they want to get that application in and be first. So, I have, a, I have a question. I think I asked this before, but what happens if they pop into your lobby, but your lobby is in Sacramento? So, what, what about people in L.A. or Central Valley? Or, oh. Most of them are sending at FedEx for the very early morning delivery. So the FedEx guy is at our door as well, along with those people in the lobby. So they're usually up there first. So they ask for the AM drop off button via FedEx. Um, so that's often what we see. Um, right now, um, we have to take the first 50 and then 50 is the cutoff. So this right. would also make it a little different. Um, early on, um, we were just trying to get through the backlog we had had to cancel, uh, I believe it was the April examination in 2020, and so we were just trying to honor those folks and work through that. We are now up to new applications, and, and so um, 
we, we keep trying to get more days, more, more examiners, and uh, look at more opportunities um, just to kind of get everybody through that we can. I think this, this regulation in particular, the whole removing dispensing audiologists from the practical exam also takes them out of the running, so it's more about hearing aid dispensers and the practical exam. Um, so that, that also does change the dynamics in the future as well. So. But our goal is to get the language to not limit us because because it, that's what it has done for years and when i first came to the board there was there were people that had not take, been able to take the exam for for a few years and it was like the old you know you wait in line for a ticket for a rock concert and you, if you were the first one at the ticket outlet you were in luck if not you were just out of luck so we we would have people come to us from certain employers that would have a stack of oh there's your 50 right there there's 50 applications and there, there it goes. Um, so, you know, they, they were almost to the point of just camping outside and waiting for that door to open because it was so important for them to get into the, to the exam. And that, that's a problem with the language that, oh, it's 50, you've got to cut it off, start all over again. So we're trying to get away from that and trying to make it easier for folks that need to take the exam. No, I think that's a really great idea and it more fair, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Can I just ask for verification on something? I think I didn't know this. Um, I'm looking at page four, top number 10. Um, is, is that true that if you fail a certain portion of the exam, you only have to retake that? Is that the way it works now? It is. Okay. So it was an evaluation done by the Office of Professional Examination Services, and I'm trying to remember when we brought that. Not that long ago. Recent? Not that long ago. Recent. But yeah. It, so the practice of failing something early on would negate your going forward with any of the other stations. Does that happen? No. Um, different stops are graded in different ways, and there are some uh, ex some safety concerns that are a ultimate stop. You must stop and you must move out of that section. Um, but I. I don't want to divulge too much, but there are different ways of different stops, and oh. sometimes the person is allowed to continue on with the exam, um, but they lose the points for that I see. activity, okay. per se. Okay. Um, and there's other times where it's you're done with this whole section. Okay. Okay. Got it. <clears throat> are, we, are we going through each line step by step, or can I just add a quick comment? Oh. <clears throat> Um, well, if we like how you did it for the last yeah, I, um, we can do that if we want. Um, if you'd like to, and just kind of a brief overview. It's mostly this is um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. We, we can we can. I was just going to say that we can hop to the summary <laughs> yeah. as opposed to going through each item by item. Yeah, the um, first page, um, the items that were removed, they're outdated uh, language, uh, mostly. We believe in regards to the written exam, um, but because we needed to be more specific, we have removed that and made the written exam its own section. Um, and then there is the updated filing period on the bottom um, that we were just discussing. On page two, on the top part, um, that is the um, when the board last saw these language that was the suggested changes um, on the topics of, that are covered in the examination, uh, practical examination. Um, so we left that at it as we didn't have any suggested changes on that one. And then, let's see. And then the second half of page two is where we um, started to describe the application. Um, so our applications need to be in regulations. And so we went with the narrative format um, when it comes um, to the practical examination. So that's what you see um, on page two, three, and maybe top of page four. Um, so it's a list of all the items we collect on the application. Um, and so we, we put the fee amount, um, personal information, um, address. Um, we also have, um, as Therese had mentioned previously, we have the expedited um, process. So asking if individuals are, you know, military or spouse of a military or asylum. 
Um, and then we do collect information about exams they've previously te taken and which they fail, as well as um, the um, request for accommodation or practical examination. Um, so that pretty much is it for the first um, section, 1399.120. Um, and just to clarify, so this is essentially putting what currently exists into the regulation. Mm -hmm. um, so there, are, there currently is a fee and there currently is a form and this essentially codifies it of, of what it is. And then the next section is 1399.121, and that's where we're going to describe the um, written examination. And so here we um, list the topics that will be covered, um, as well as we also provide, um, we also put in the application request in there, um, the application information description in here as well. Um, yeah, so it's very, it's close, it's similar to the practical exam essentially, but having in regulations what is already available to the public. Uh, just a quick comment, just for um, consistency's sake. <clears throat> the thing that popped out to me, anyone cheating will be removed from the examination room. On the 1399.120, it's in A, and then on 1399.121, it's in D. <clears throat> Just to make it um, consistent, maybe we could do it either in D or in A together, right? Like so, so in written examination, uh, D is fine, and then in uh, practical examination, put it in 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 D. Just 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 to make it like. Um, yeah, I understand what you, yeah. uh, what you're saying. Um, so for <laughs> anything that's already in regulations, ideally we don't want to move it. Okay. Um, so that's why it's A, because okay. we had to remove all the other items, but we found it applicable um, for the practical exam. And so we were adding it oh, also I get to the it. examination. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, since it's already in the practical examination, um, in that format, that's why it's A. Mm -hmm. um, Got it. But we can move the other one to A if that's, um, since we are adding it there. Got it. I understand now. And just to uh, make sure, clarify, to do the practical and the written, the total then would be seven hundred twenty-five dollars. Five hundred for practical and two twenty-five for written. Right. That is correct. Got it. Um, just oh. briefly. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I will, just, if they have to retake it, do they pay again? Even if it's just that one single part. Yes, they do. Okay. Unless they win an appeal, correct? Then they yes, they, they can appeal, appeal they and there is a section on that. Oh, um, I saw that appeal. Examiner misconduct. So uh, we do have uh, OPS and senior examiners review appeals, and of course, then we make a determination. There are times where uh, the examiners and myself believe it's merited to comp to um, allow them to retake for free, um, and it just depends on the circumstances. Okay. Um, I had a question. Um, it's just a very small thing. Uh, 1399.121 uh, B, where it says uh, commonly employed in hearing, in fitting and selling of hearing aids, including. Should that maybe say including but not limited to? It has to say including. Yes, we've actually had uh, the Office of Administrative Law become very uncomfortable with the including but not limited to. They feel that that's vague, that doesn't give enough specificity, and courts have ruled that shall include or including is an expansive term, so you don't have to have the phrase but not limited to for it to mean not limited to. Okay, um, just, but they, they, they let you got away, they let you got away with it earlier, because you actually have including but not limited to in an, in an earlier section, so you're allowed one. Well, no, I saw it, and because it has to do with how the Office of Administrative Law is now interpreting and mm. requiring the justification, I consider that a non-substantial change that the executive officer is granted to do, and so I kept my mouth shut as I sat up here and saw included but not limited to, but I crossed it out because you have other things to think about. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Any other uh, questions or uh, comments about this one area she's covered? Okay. Um, so we're on page seven. We're looking at 1399.122 on the practical examination appeals. And these were changes that the board um, adopted um, previously that we're just bringing it back here um, to make it as part of the examination packet. Um, we had no suggested changes. And then lastly, it's 1399.152.4 on the dispensing audiologist exam requirement. And this will make specific um, that the written exam or the examination to dispense hearing aid will be only the written examination. And so this is the regulations that will remove that um, examine the practical examination requirement. Um, we can get clarification, sure. No? No? Um, just one one thing on the um that going over the outline, this is one thing that's been talked about uh, in the past was the um, the amount of the of questions on the test related to um, state and federal guidelines and regulations and what a tiny, tiny portion of the test usually covers that. It would be, on, it would be number four, page six. Has there been any uh, discussion about looking at expanding that with having OPES um, look at maybe expanding that so there's more um, more emphasis put on what would be considered the ethical and legal um, aspects of the job? I think there's a, a couple of things. One is we're talking to we're going to talk to OPES about the exam itself and um, about what the exam should contain. And then I asked staff to look at that, and I think they worked with legal on identifying that specifically in regulation. He's talking about uh, the, the issues that have to do with the sales. Okay, the on the yeah. information. page five, we have California state and federal laws and regulations concerning the sale of hearing aids, which shall include the legal obligation to client to adjust, replace, and refund hearing aids and requirements of documenting hearing aids, aid sales. Um, and so that covers like Song Beverly or um, let's see, yeah, Song Beverly or some of the disclosure like the lock hearing aid and then um, maintaining records for the seven years. Um, so that's the language we have. Um, I'll ha I defer to Paul about how we can work with OPS to make sure that that gets a little bit more emphasized on the exam. So this is the beginning uh, of that process, identifying it, uh, identifying it in law, codifying it in regulation. We're we're trying to make sure that if it's weighted here, now we go and make sure that the the individuals that are creating these exams um, apply that to the exam. Um, what about the uh, option of increasing the weight of it? So right now it's three percent. And the option of uh, going back and saying, hey, should this maybe be 5% or 10% or what? I think that's something we can, we can talk to them about. But there's a whole process that goes into the development of the exam. And I think part of that is our discussions with OPES and making sure that they understand that it has its proper place. But I do think that there's a whole exam development process that needs to be followed to mm -hmm. certain practices involved there. So we will do our best to make sure that that happens. Thank you. And then provided for materials are the um, previously board approved language, as well as the outline that we use to develop the uh, written exam topics. And I believe also there's a practical exam, the most um, current um, task and knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, any questions? We uh, open up to uh, the public. Are there any questions? You can open up WebEx. We are now open for public comment on WebEx. 
If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star 3 to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. Let us take just a few seconds now to see if we have requests for public comment. Seeing no request for comments, would you like to move on to Ms. Dominguez? Please. Please. There is, there is no one else present with me for public comment. Thank you. Uh, I don't see where there was an action requested on this section. There is. Did I miss it? Page two of the memo, it has a... I looked and looked for that. I knew there had to be something we had to act upon if we were going to... the go committee may wish to okay, recommend. there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we we're looking for a motion for the, uh, for the committee to recommend that the full board approve the regulatory language and initiate the rulemaking process. You're on. So I move that we, uh, that the committee <laughs> um, wish okay. to recommend to the full board uh, to approve the regulatory language and initiate the rulemaking process. I second. If we could uh, open the floor to public comment. And if we could open up the WebEx, please. We are once again open for public comment on WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. We're gonna take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for comment. Seeing no request for comments, do you wish to move on to Ms. Dominguez? Please. Uh, no one present for our public comment. Thank you. Okay, we can then call the roll. Marsha Raja. Aye. Amy. Aye. Karen. Aye. And myself, Todd Borges, aye. Motion carries. And I believe is that is our last topic we have for the uh, Hearing Aid Dispensers Committee. Thank you all very much. I appreciate all your time and putting up with me for my first in-person uh, committee meeting. Yay. All right. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. What do you think about taking five minutes before we release? Yeah. Um, so I'd like to call to, sorry, what do I have to do? Oh, okay, sorry. Are we ready? Okay. Uh, I'd like to call to order the audiology practice committee and um, I'd first like to call the roll. Um, Karen Chang? Here. Amy White? Here. Yeah, I am here also, so I think we have a quorum. Uh, I'd like to ask any staff or, um, or board administration to identify themselves if they'd like to. Paul Sanchez, board executive officer. Michael Canotes, board legal counsel. Shirley Burns, assistant executive officer. No? Okay. Um, at this point then, I'd like to ask for public comment for items not on the agenda. <clears throat> we can open the web WebEx.
We are now open for public comments on items not on the agenda. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. For dial-in users, please dial star 3 to raise your hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. Let's take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for comments, would you like to move on to uh, Ms. Dominguez? Yes, thank you. Uh, there is no one present with me for public comment. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to move to agenda item number three, discussion and possible action regarding statutory and or regulatory requirements related to audiology aid scope of practice and supervision requirements as stated in um, Business and Profession Code Section 2530.2 and Title 16 um, CCR Section 1399.154 through 1399.154.7. Um, I'd like to just begin by summarizing the issue. Um, the, the board has received a number of uh, reports through various means that there appears to be a lack of clarity about the role and um, uh, tasks that an audiology aide can, can perform and also the supervision requirements for audiology aides. Um, there appears to be the feeling that either it's um, uh, that audiology aides historically have been allowed to do essentially anything an audiologist could do without the experience and training to do it, or the interpretation is that it's so restrictive that they can't do anything, and therefore, what is the point of having an audiology aid? Um, so we are, we are well aware of these concerns um, and, these, and the complaints about them. Um, we, we know that um, audiology aides are trained, at least on the job, uh, to do certain tasks. And some people are trained well and some people aren't. We can't control that. We do ask for applications for this register. This is not a licensee, but a registration with the state. We ask what the plan is for what the activities they'll do, the training they'll receive, the supervision they'll receive. But even so, that's still not clear enough. But historically, the reason we didn't move on this sooner or make more definitive plan is because it was difficult to um, determine a list that, are, that contained do's and don'ts for audiology aids uh, because they were either thought to be too restrictive or uh, they were interpreted as, uh, it was open to interpretation that led to confusion about what they could do and what they couldn't do. So. Um, You'll notice in our board book package on this topic that all of the current language, the statutory and regulatory language appears um, on page two through, I think, um, maybe five. Um, so in discussing this further, we, we wanted to look at um, how should we approach this considering the conflicts and one, one way that we're thinking about it or possibly would go is to create a license type um, and determine it to be an audiology assistant as much as an, a SLIPA uh, would be a, a, a licensed entity. Um, and that, I think that's gaining popularity, that idea of, of then creating uh, all the requirements that, to make it very clear what they can and can't do. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we want to put some structure on what is current, the current practices. Um, what are the, what's allowed, what's the scope, what are the limitations or parameters, and move toward um, this licensure category at some point. But at this point, I would like to open up the discussion to talk about um, how we could, at this point, uh, kind of put some structure to the current um, Allowances, I guess I should should say. Uh, 
I'm inter- yeah, I'm interested in, w- in what Amy has to say. Yeah, so um, in reviewing, you know, uh, really pages four and five here, um, bringing up the discussion on should we try and be all inclusive where we're defining everything that an aid can do versus looking more just the prohibited side and and listing out what what would be prohibited and I think that the latter is probably a, a, the easier way to go um, discussing prohibited practices rather than trying to define all of the items that they can do but instead look at what they cannot do um, and then as as looking at more like how uh, the SLIPA has defined levels of supervision and, and maybe um, more clearly defining that would also be relevant and helpful. I think we would agree that there are certain activities that require more supervision than others and would be able to delineate that um, much as the SLIPA model does. Um, one, one notion uh, is that we could say at this point that an audiology aid cannot do anything that requires a license to do. Um, that may not make some people happy because the reason they have an audiology aid is to free up the audiologist um, so that they can do other jobs, see other patients, do whatever they want to do. But if it takes a license to do ABR, uh, tympanometry, ear mold impressions, um, are, are we being safe or too restrictive to say um, if it takes a license, an aide should not be doing it? Uh, would you be able to give me an example then, just a short example then what an audiology aid can do? Yeah, I think there are some. <clears throat> some listings in here somewhere about it. Um, oh, right here, I see it. That makes it safe, safe activities that they can do. Uh, they're allowed to perform maintenance, preparation, and infection control procedures for testing equipment, testing materials, and treatment. Um, allowed to perform and administer without interpretation, which is an important piece to this. They can do it, they just can't interpret what they're, the results that they get. Um, although, the next thing says audiology aids with adequate training allowed to perform without interpretation, interpretation yeah. otoscopy, tympanometry, and taking ear impressions. Again, those are items that really do take a license to be able to do. And you can't do otoscopy without interpreting <laughs> at the very same time. That's, it's innate in doing it. Okay. Um, so, so it would just be um, audiology, they could do basically the first bullet point. And then possibly the second bullet point. Yes. Okay, but not the third. I don't think so, no. And there's, you know, there's, this is an exhaustive list. There are other things than ADH, audiology. Age and they, yeah. Okay. Just, I just wanted to add, uh, Dr. Rajo, that at the end of the packet, there are examples of potential audiology aid tasks, and there's another page with potentially prohibited tasks. Are you looking at the AAA? Um, Document or uh, action oh, or talking about I'm attachment at eight. The yeah. end page, I see it. Yeah. Attachment. Oh, that's H. a good one. Yeah. The very last. The very last page. page. Oh. So we could we could adopt a list like this at this point. Is, is this list okay uh, if, if you look at it? I'm, I'm not um, in this field, so. I know, yeah. you notice at the top it's labeled potentially. Acceptable, acceptable to, yeah. Tasks. So who, who makes the <clears throat> determination whether it is or not? And, and if so, do, if we said, well, assisting with treatment programs, that's a pretty broad statement, uh, treatment programs. Um, oh, it says uh, assisting audiologists in treatment programs, right? With physical preparation for patient uh-huh. uh, for evaluation. You know, I think that many of these are, are reasonable. It says performing ear impressions under direct supervision. An audiologist would say, if I have to stand there over the shoulder, I might as well do it myself. Exactly. Um, I was reading, I think it was in 
oh, one of these materials, I believe from ASHA that was talking about direct versus indirect supervision and that, oh, I wish I had highlighted that page, it, um, that they were both considered to be in the physical proximity of, and you didn't have to be like over the shoulder line of sight, but you had to be in an adjacent room and, and either of those would be acceptable in terms of what they consider direct versus indirect. I don't know if we want to, um, consider something similar because I agree, you know, if, if we're saying, well, you can do an ear impression if I'm standing here watching you, then then why wouldn't I just do it myself? All right. No, I understand that. And that makes sense to me that if you're in the proximity, uh, it, this is all prefaced on the notion that they're adequately trained, right? And that they have been over the shoulder supervised for many, many impressions before they. So is our, in that, as you mentioned in the introduction, talking about moving perhaps more to something uh, more akin to like an audiology assistant where there's a more education requirement of some sort. Is our goal initially here to tighten up what we're doing with the aid because there is no significant education component, kind of perhaps even be reducing that down to what they're allowed to do with the intention of moving forward for creating a different category with education required that would then be more broad? in terms of their ability. I think I need some clarification a bit on that. Yeah. There is discussion in here about developing continuing education and registration, but my understanding is that would be part of the audiology assistant uh, regulatory package and not, or statutory even, um, and not necessarily the, uh, the objective of what we're trying to do today. Would you like me to clarify? So. Where are, we are we talking about the proposals that were part of our sunset review? I, I think that's where they're maybe getting a little bit yeah. crossed. Um, so, so any talk about an audiology assistant as a separate registration category, how the SLPO system is, um, would require a sunrise application with the Business and Professions Committee and some statutory authority to create that new type. Um, so this is not that. Um, it's, it's, we do understand that is a national trend and most likely it will come our way. And in the meantime, we currently have a very vague category of aid that seems to be encompassing some of these people that will probably be going for assistant. We are seeing more applications with um, people with more education and experience coming in, um, which is I think begging the question of can they do more and we should really we're looking at how do we tighten up the aid registration, knowing that in the future, the assistant category may come along, but this is not to prepare it at all. So it's a little bit separate, and that's the hard part. I, I think I understand that. But yeah. It was just the issue of um, the CEU um, uh, issue and having to be registered. That's part of the future. That, and that's part of the sunset provision to have right. a renewal and continuing oh, yeah. education requirement for the aid. Um, and that is currently not in our sunset bill yet. It is still under discussion with the legislature. Okay, so, okay, so it will be, or we hope to be. We hope. So that's also a separate track, but but it will, it, it's part of the, the, looking at the audiology aid and the whole designation of the audiology aid and, and what it should be. But that is, that is separate. Oh, oh, I'm not, okay. Yeah, sorry. you are. Yes, okay. <laughs> But that, but that is separate, and I think that the, what, it, what Amy described, uh, I'm sorry, what Dr. White described <laughs> was actually uh, accurate and I think a good direction for the board because you do, you are looking at consumer protection and you're looking at something, uh, a designation that is somewhat broad, uh, vague to many people and unclear. And if, if there is a, a trend in, in the practice of audiology to have these assistants and they're coming with training and certification, that's something, that's something that the board will want to probably look at and possibly pursue. And so that begs the question then what, if right now it is very broad. So certainly we have aids operating where they are doing impressions and, and maybe things that might be a little more um, certainly potentially dangerous if they're not trained properly. Um, were we to tighten these restrictions, would those practices be grandfathered in or would they say, you know, we would say, no, you're, even if you're already a registered aide, you've been doing this for 10 years and you are trained, it doesn't matter, you're no longer allowed to do X, Y, and Z based on the decisions we're making. That's an interesting question. Well, we currently have an examination that the purpose of the examination is to ensure that uh, a person who is going to dispense hearing aids can properly fit hearing aids and, and, and make those ear mold impressions. So I think we 
would have to be really specific about that and, and let people know that if you're going to do that, you need to get a license. You need to pass an examination to do that. I think that does require a license. Is it, but is that current? I mean, has that been these plans? Because right now, the way it's written, you submit a plan of what you want your aid to do. This is how I'm going to train them. This is how I'm going to use them. These are the activities they're going to pursue for me. Have we been disallowing things like ear impressions and or has that sometimes been accepted based on the plan and the training? So, so do we have aides out there doing those activities? They, they shouldn't be. And I think that's, what, that's the purpose of this discussion is to make sure that we're more clear about what the parameters are for the audiology aid designation. Because staff have used a measure of, of invasiveness and ear mold impressions would be extremely invasive and they haven't gone through an examination for it. So I don't think anyone's been, to my knowledge, they're not approving people to do ear mold impressions right now. Um, the question of what you do once you're registered, because we only see you at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? So you register with us, you're brand new, you're getting training. Um, without a renewal requirement and requirement that the supervisor tell us often and with, with some sort of piece there to say you have to tell us what's going on, how, how has it changed, what is the tasks that have changed over time due to the training. Um, we kind of don't really get a measure of that. I know we ask for it right now, but there isn't a um, if you don't give it to us stick there. You know what I mean? Can I ask, uh, Charisse, you part of the reason this arose currently uh, had to do with applications mm -hmm. being backed up because there were issues on them that suggested activities that may be outside the scope. and. Wasn't that true that there there were some supervisors who were asking? They are asking for, for them to do it, yes. Maybe it wasn't ear impressions, but something else? There were some others holding the patients. Um, I think one had ear mold impressions on it and a couple other tasks that seemed a little too invasive. And so those were kind of the question areas. Um, a lot of, and, and I'm going to say, is, is we are seeing more where they're saying, oh, but I'm hiring somebody who has education and experience in doing certain things, so I want them to do more. So that kind of begs the question of we don't really have a, we don't have a space, we don't have a structure for that, we don't have the immediate uh, direct and indirect supervision for AIDS, it's all kind of amorphous, so approving Approval is just a, is essentially approval. Go go forth and you said the tasks and it's okay. So, if you look at the list of potentially acceptable tasks on page one of two uh, in a, attachment G, there are a number of, of um, activities that are definitely um, acceptable in my view uh, for an audiology aid to do. Then it drifts down into more complex tasks that require. Um, uh, I would say more supervision and or more training, mm -hmm. they get a little, you know, more challenging in terms of accepting doing this. And when you look over a potentially prohibited task, they're a little bit vague. Um, the audiology assistant is not qualified to do. And who judges that? And that, that would be the problem for the board. It's going to have to be some sort of measure that the supervisor is certifying something there, staff is not really trained on how to, to know that. So we, we don't have a structure currently. Um, and that's where it gets a little difficult. We don't have, um, oh, where is it? The, um, Shreesh, can you tell us the origins of the list? Is this the list that was put together by previous uh, boards or committees? This list started previously with the board many years ago, and okay. then I think um, uh, Dr. Raggio took a look at it. This is also um, in looking at different lists by okay. ASHA of what's allowed for their audiology assistant. So I think it's taking in a lot of different areas and then trying to use our, our best judgment. Um, this is not something that's in, been implemented, so this is definitely right. still something that is a potential. Um, so that's an important point of clarity. This isn't a recommendation. This is yeah. just kind of, for example, this is what something could look like. Because we even use the term audiology assistant in the document, and I think that's because it came from an audiology assistant type document. But yeah. this is really just something for us to. Um, and board with. staff wanted to have a list so that you guys, um, those that aren't actually out there as audiologists with assistance, and I might see some of the tasks that they were ta they're talking about or that out there. 
So um, I think it was at least helpful in enlightening us on that, not that we're saying please adopt it and let's go. Um, but we, we don't need new regulations to be able to develop a list. It's, it's already in regulation that we can the board can do that. Is that correct? The board doesn't have a list in regulations right now. No, it doesn't. Yeah. But the ability to create one. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to, we don't need new regulations in order to do that. That's my point. Well, well just, just chiming in. If we're going to adopt standards and tasks that aides can perform or not perform, that would be a rule of general applicability and we would need to do that in regulation. Yeah. And that's where um, it begs the other question. So um, currently, you know, the statute authorizes the board to designate requirements related to the extent, kind, and quality of services performed by the aid. And so then you could consider, are there any sort of minimum requirements, um, any training requirements that might relate to the extent or kind of services that an audiology aid is allowed to do, and then we would define them in regulation. Um, currently, 1399.154.4 uh, requires aides to complete a training program established by the supervisor um, prior to being allowed to assist in the practice of audiology. We could start clarifying some of those requirements and also explaining what sort of amount of training is required for certain tasks. Um, I think that would be something that you could go through as well. And that's where um, Rather than, than putting a list into the regulations, it seems more that we might want to talk about categories of activities or categories of tasks and that, you know, these are allowed, you, you obviously have to train your aid, but maybe there are slightly more complex activities that don't require a license in order to do them that after a certain amount of immediate training or over the shoulder training, your aid can do. And it'd be up to the supervisor to certify that and make sure that they're doing that before they start commencing those activities. We just don't spell any of that out currently. So there is that opportunity to spell that out. If we're not, I mean, you could always just make a list if you really, really want to. There's just always difficulties with making lists like this. So it's, it's I was trying to like think about how we could talk about these things. There is the prohibited side, you know, you can't do certain things. There's types of activities and categories. Um, you know, you're not going to perform temponometry. You're not going to do certain things like that. Uh, you can't do something to diagnose someone. Um, but maybe the activities can be set up so that the, the easier ones, so the, you know, greeting and escorting patients, scheduling, conducting inventories, performing checks. I mean, a lot of those are things you can do much closer out of the gate without much as, as much training as the other ones, where you get into preparing the materials for ear impression and performing equipment maintenance and performing pure tone hearing screenings without interpretation. And so if we get a little more defined on how that works, um, does that actually how, help us? How do we... In terms of data collection, <laughs> is it possible to audit the plans that have been approved and to see what tasks um, audiologists are asking their aides to be utilized for so that we could see what maybe the, the scope or the breadth of that is? Is it really truly very wide and, and some of these plans have gotten through in the last eight, ten years and they are very different than what maybe is being approved now or has there been very has it been very consistent in, ten, let's say, in a 10-year period for what types of plans or activities have been approved versus not, or is there a way to audit that and kind of pull all that together so we could take it into consideration? Absolutely. Just like we looked at the um, uh, not approved, the, the denied uh, CE courses for hearing aid dispensers, we can take a look. I guess um, because I, I'm concerned that, you know, if we because it was rather broad or is very broad right now, and then we decide to narrow it down because that makes sense maybe to do just what the impact of that would be on, on those that are already operating with their aid and, and how that would affect operations of those audiologists. Um, and I would suggest that I don't know about consistency prior to myself. So sure, of course. Yeah, um, I, I think we have a team that is very cognizant and very detailed. Um, but I, I would not be able to say it. 10 years ago it was the same folks, or, or even if it, it was the same kind of AIDS people were looking to register. Um, 
now, I mean, that's the thing with the national trend, right? They're seeing something else out there. They've finished this amount of degree. They've done some, some on-the-job training. Well, and because we don't require any check back. I mean, there's no yeah. check back in to see what they are doing or, or an update to their plan, you know, as to what activities they've taken on and yeah. since, before, you know, they were new and now it's five years later, have they gained additional activities and we just haven't notified the board of that and or have they just left the field yeah. right would it be a legitimate approach to only list what they can do and thus we don't have to list what they can't do you could that is one route you can go um, i would point out that it can be rather restrictive and you are um, limiting it and just understanding how long regs take, um, amending that to add new things that are similar or like but not named could be problematic in the future. So oftentimes that's why. Um, well, I mean, even as, even in categories. The categories I think would be more easily understandable and implemented. So if it's a like activity in a category, then that would be simple enough, yeah. right? Without saying categories of what they can't do. You there could. value to that? The question you might might run into is right now the statute is pretty broad, so you may want to clarify that there are things that they can't do. Or clarify uh, supervision. You could clarify supervision, and I just don't know if that would automatically write out some of the things we hear that people are doing that they maybe shouldn't be. That they maybe took that statute a little too far that they can do anything the audio, under the supervision of the audiologist. But we can um, very easily easily <laughs> um, <laughs> make determinations as to educational requirements or specific training requirements. I'm going to pause on educational requirements just because the aid registration and statute doesn't seem like it lends itself to an educational requirement mm -hmm. as much as it might a experience and training requirement because that leads you to, uh, let's see, when we're talking extent and kind and developing standards for that, that seems to be within the board's statutes. That's kind of referenced as determining that, um, those kind of requirements. Normally in our statute, if you're gonna implement educational requirements, it's, it's talked about also in the statute. So the SLIPA has educational requirements in the statute um, as where we have minimum registration requirements, which I don't, I could be wrong, as I'm definitely not the lawyer um, or any lawyer, um, that it, it doesn't seem to be in the same way that all of our other statutes that allow for educational requirements to be determined by the board where it's not specific in the statute. So flip as it does talk about requiring a degree and that the board will develop regulations to determine the rest of it. Um, AIDS, it's just established minimum requirements for the registration. So is requiring any specific training program akin to requiring education? So it's not a degree, but it's a training program that exists? I think training program tends to go more towards the fact that the statute says the board can determine uh, standards, where is it at? Uh, standards related to the extent, kind, and quality of services performed by the aid. So when you get into that, you're saying the board has these standards for supervision, and that determines kind of the extent and kinds of services. Could be. Teresa's covering this very well, but let me just chime in to say that anytime, anytime aids are used generally in the business and professions area of the codes, we're talking about unlicensed persons. Mm -hmm. So um, generally to have a requirement for an education, an educational requirement, we'd be talking about a new license type. Any formal training is all the same. It's all under that umbrella of education. Correct. Okay. I mean, we, we could, the legislature could adopt a statute and say, in order to identify yourself as an audiology aide, you have to have this education. But really that, that starts, that walks us into the area where now we're talking about a license. Rather, rather than just an aide who is a lay person that has some training requirements um, who may need to register with the board, but is not, is not um, seeking an ed a specific education and then um, being tested, being issued a license. So, I mean, I think in theory an aid is, is an excellent 
option, right, as a, as a provider to have an aide be able to help you see more patients and do the types of patient care that maybe don't require your professional knowledge and skills. But it's confusing when you're out there practicing because you're working in hospitals or ENT clinics, for example, that use, they call them ototex, right? So it's like an aid that a medical doctor uses. And they, 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 because they're on the medical doctor's license, they can do all the things the audiologist does. They can do hearing tests, they can do balance exams, they can do all sorts of testing, um, you know, and we're working right alongside them as an audiologist. So then when you're in a situation where, well, I could have an audiology aid, well, the medical doctor aid with no specific training gets to do everything the audiologist can do. So wouldn't I, as an audiologist, allow my aid to do those things too? Um, and I think that's where the confusion comes in from the public, or from the public, from the audiologist, you know, out in the field. Um, it's very confusing to look at other aids on other licenses that have the freedom to operate however that licensee sees fit essentially and have all of that freedom, whereas we aren't operating that same way over here. I'm not suggesting we should, um, but I think that's where it gets very confusing on, on what an aid really is for an audiologist. That's always been the issue though um, for as long as I've been on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Physicians can hire their front office staff right. to do tympanometry, mm -hmm. and there's nothing it appears we can do about that. Right. Um, that's always been the way it is. So I think the question is, do we, how functional is an aid for an audiologist if we're not going to require an educational requirement? Is it really that functional? Is it really safe? You know, do we really want aids out there doing some of these activities that it sure would be useful to have them do? but maybe it's not the best idea because there's not an education. So I think having a, um, a trajectory, you know, in mind is important. That reminds me of some, I was just curious. Uh, there, there are, there is an, uh, at least one, if not more, audiology assistant pro educational programs in California. CSU LA mm -hmm. has one. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happens to those people once they get, they have to take 30 units and do a lot of stuff. It's like a year program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they don't have any other different classification than an aide, right? They're not becoming an audiologist. And that's, that's technically all they can be registered as, as mm -hmm. is an audiology aide. So I, wonder um, I, I can tell you that we have seen, we've seen uh, job postings about assistants that there is no such assistant category and the um, job title does not it does not reference any requirement to be registered as an aide with us either. So there is that other what's going on in the field problem. Mm -hmm. um, so would it be um, reasonable for uh, us to ask that the audiology uh, practice committee uh, try to develop some sort of categorical um, activities that, that can be done um, it, with perhaps some supervisory language, if that's appropriate, to bring back to the full board. Um, perhaps not by tomorrow, but you know. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I think this might be a long conversation. I, I think the statute very clearly in 2530.6 is going to tell us that the supervising audiologist or speech language pathologist, because it's both in this one, um, shall be responsible for the extent, kind, and quality of services performed by the aid. But it has a comma and a contingency there that says consistent with the board's designated standards and requirements. So I think if we're going to focus on that and we focus on the standards, the supervision, and making sure the training that is required of them is appropriate, then I, I think that firms this up. And then I think that really does help the licensed community. It does keep kind of in check the safety concerns. Um, and you know, in the future, when the conversation comes up about assistance, if if the aid is a clear category, then it'll it'll be that much easier when we're looking in the future. What, what was that code again? Twenty five thirty point six, page nine of your book, if you have your blue book in front of you. Mm -hmm. So, if we have that purview, then would it be appropriate then to to have the audiology practice committee? Um, take a stab at coming up with some language that, or some categorization? Uh, I think it would be helpful. I think at least if we that. can start building something for the committee to look at and talk about and, and flesh out with the, the regulated community here, 
um, that that would be great. And I, I, I feel like once we start putting more on the paper for more to discuss, then it'll it'll get easier to put those categories together, I think. Okay. So any further discussion about it? I think the other the other item I just want to point out is there is a variety of, of ways to define things. You don't have to use the SLIPA supervision. Um, concept the the idea is just really to if we nail down supervision aspects does that help us along with these issues um, to, to determine those standards for supervision and what what should require the audiologist to be in the room on site what's allowed when they're not on site um, those kind of considerations with consumer safety in mind so do you envision that if we had an, an audiology assistant license type that we would still have audiology aids I'm going to tell you we currently still have speech language pathology aids and we get a handful of applications per year so we do still get those. Um, I think the one thing to think about is um, workforce development wise, right? There's going to be a lot of people that get a certain amount of education and having them as an aid keeps them at that lower level but if they have the education, this is an opportunity. It's a workforce development opportunity as well. Um, it's an opportunity to use that education and experience. Um, what you'll find with speech language pathology is there's always still people that aren't able to get the speech language pathology assistant. Uh, associates or bachelors and the field work and so you do see people that end up in the aid category still. Um, so that is one of the difficulties and of course as we noted in our sunset the legislature is very um, particular on the idea of taking something away. So if there are still people coming into the category because they can't meet the bar of assistant then there's that space still and how do you they call it uh, how do you offboard or, or how do you give them a ramp to the assistant category if you're going to get rid of it altogether? Mm -hmm. um, and as where it might be a different conversation for the legislature, if no one ever applied for a speech language pathology aid in the last 10 years, then maybe it's a different conversation, but we still do have that. So, okay, thank you. And we do get people that call all the time looking for how to get into a field work program, how to do certain things. So, okay, so. Um, I, I would like to propose not, not quite <laughs> make a motion, but I'm thinking out loud that not only should the audiology practice committee perhaps work on this, but with um, board staff uh, along with this, because you know you know uh, just a ton of things that would be helpful to us um, <laughs> to develop that. So is that a legitimate uh, motion that that uh, we could entertain? Yeah. Would the committee like to designate one of the members of the committee to work with the staff and? Does it have to be one person? I think it can be up to two, just like we've done before. Okay, so that's okay. But correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. You're good. That is correct. Okay, uh, up to two. It, it can be. It could be more, but then you would have to have noticed public meetings. Okay. So does anyone want to make that motion? A motion to have, um, uh, was it an ad hoc committee at that point? It's not a committee. It's just to ask board staff to work with someone from the audiology practices committee or two members of the audiology practices committee um, to come up with some language and guidelines regarding the audiology aid. I second. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in opening it up to public comment at this point to see what uh, what the feeling is out there. So I know Sharice has some public information, but we can also open. Um, and before we open it up to WebEx, I'm going to go ahead and read the written public comment we received. And this is from a Debbie Clark, uh, Pacific Hearing Service in Los Altos. And she thanks um, all of us for all of you for being on the board. And she's very grateful for the work that you do. Uh, she thanks you for taking up the issue of audiology assistance. It's a topic that is top of mind for our audiology practice and they would like to make the following comments. 
and it goes, with the shortage of audiologists in the Bay Area, clinics and private practices are stretched thin and we depend on our audiology assistants to help us provide excellent care and follow up for our patients. A particular concern to us is the fact that audiology assistants are not able to perform otoscopic checks for wax. We would like to explain why this would be helpful to us and believe to most practices and how this could be done with strong consideration to safety of the patient. Why? So often patients arrive in the clinic with very dirty hearing aids or hearing complaints they believe to be due to a malfunctioning hearing aid. We see the ability for the assistant to inspect the ear canal as triage and not diagnostic. We believe most audiology clinics would benefit from having an audiology assistant available who could inspect the ear canal using an otoscope and determine if the next step is to make an appointment for wax removal, a hearing test, or investigating the need for hearing aid repair. Safety. We agree that if audiology assistants take on this responsibility, it should only be done after proper and thorough training. In this day and age when patients can purchase otoscopy cameras on Amazon and essentially look into their own ears, we feel it is in the best interest to have someone who has at a minimum who has at a minimum been trained to inspect for occlusion of the ear. In addition, they could look for domes and wax guards that often end up in the patient's ear canal. Finally, we believe that having direct supervision at all times is not helpful to the clinic or audiology practice. We are seeking clarity on what the assistants can do independently. For example, we believe they can teach a patient to insert their hearing aids, teach the patient basic teach the patient regarding basic use and care of the instruments, help them with accessories and smartphone compatibility and otoscopic checks. Thank you so much for your considering our comments. We can go to the WebEx now. All right, we are accepting public comment through WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment through the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. And our first request comes from Deborah Clark. Bear with us just a moment and we will send you a request to, to unmute your microphone. Am I unmuted now? Yes, go ahead, please. Hey, great, thanks. Uh, well, I don't have much left to say since you just read my letter and thank you so much for that. Um, so the only thing I will add is that um, I would love to provide input to the committee. <laughs> so we, when you do put together your committee, I think our practice would love to, um, uh, to be asked uh, our opinions on audiology assistance. So that, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you and thanks again for reading my comments. And next on the list, we have Christy Kursich. Help me if I mispronounce that. Bear with us just a moment, and we're sending you a request to unmute your microphone. All right, Christy, I saw that you unmuted and then remuted. Let's try again. There. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Christy Kirsch. I'm the clinic director from San Diego State University. Um, I'm uh, first. I just like to thank you for discussing this topic. Um, I, I have a couple things. I do think that uh, both categories, aid and assistant, would continue to be used. Um, I get confused in terms of which one is the. Uh, aid and which is the assistant, but I can imagine um, front desk staff uh, using people in the less trained category um, and those sites also perhaps hiring a, a more trained um, assistant to to help. We're a training institution and the reason that I'm really um, interested in this is um, we're trying to make sure that our students understand the proper use of aids or assistance in the clinic. I want to make sure I'm teaching them correctly. I want to make sure that we're using ours correctly. Um, so I'm I'm really looking for clear guidelines in terms of what duties they are able to perform 
and what is the um, definition of direct supervision. So I, I want to thank you for taking this topic up, um, especially with the changing landscape of hearing aid delivery. Um, and uh, and I want to um, uh, follow, uh, I, I'm interested in following what you do, but most I want to thank you because I think this is a really, really uh, pertinent topic that we need to address for audiologists across the state. All right, thank you very much. And that appears to be the entirety of our request for comments for WebEx. Would you like to move toward to uh, Ms. Dominguez? Sure. There is no one present with me for public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, are there, is there any further discussion from the uh, committee members? I was somewhat intrigued by the notion of triage. Um, it sounds like an interesting way to, to go. I suspect that there is some interpretation that goes with triage. <laughs> and while it feels better than just jumping in there and doing that, and rather just delegating, uh, what do you think? Is it, <laughs> it's still, it still would require some interpretation. I am, am not an audiologist, but most um, licensed professionals, such as registered nurses that do triage, um, have a certain amount of training on, on implementing those criteria um, for patients. Um, I have also heard, um, I think it was at a previous board meeting, uh, someone asked about using potentially video autoscopy so that the uh, aide is looking at the ear, taking a snapshot, and then the audiologist is saying, yes, no, maybe so. I mean, I don't mean to say it like that. It's, it's obviously a more important determination, but that, that is kind of the idea there. Um, so, of course, not being the audiologist, I, I, it, it begs the question. I think it's something you guys should look at. I think you should think about the ways in which untrained people should be doing those things and what level of supervision, maybe what level of training. Um, definitely defer to you guys. Kind of an interesting middle ground, perhaps. Um, I mean, they're only asking about triaging for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Could there be, could that be extended to other more involved uh, issues? I don't know. Cool. Anyway, any other discussion among the committee members about it? Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. I'd like to call for the vote. Dr. Baggio? Uh, Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Dr. White? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, moving on to um, discussion item four, um, update discussion and possible action regarding audiology licensing requirements related to supervised clinical and professional experience as stated in BMP code sections 2532.2 and 2532.25 and Title 16, CCR section 1399.152.2. Uh, Sharice, I have you as the... Uh, Paul and I uh, wanted to provide the committee with an update. So originally um, part of our plan was if it was already in the sunset, let's go ahead and start hammering out the language that we want in the regulation. As it currently stands, the uh, changing to allow, changing the statute to allow pre-didactic um, hours to count is not in the statute and we are not sure what it will look like. Um, so we just wanted to provide the update that it still seems a little preemptive um, right now. We don't know if they'll go um, one way or another with that statutory change. We do not have a um, no-go, it's not a no-go yet. It's, we're still in discussions with the Sunset Committee on how to get the provisions and what they're comfortable with. Um, and so it might behoove us to have our meeting in August um, when we have the next board meeting to have another audiology committee meeting to start working on those regs. Um, so hopefully we'll know by then, are, are we getting to use pre-didactic? Um, are they willing to move away from 12 months? Um, maybe they're only willing to accept hours, the, the 1,850 hours that are equivalent to the 12 months. Um, 
we just aren't quite sure we're on strong footing to start working on a regulation at this moment. So that we wanted to provide that update. We wanted everyone to know we're still working on it. it you'll see in the bill tomorrow, it's not in there. So, um, but that it also seemed a little preemptive to start hammering out language related to, can you use the pre, um, the, the, those clinical rotation hours towards your RPE before the, the sunset committee is willing to put it into a bill. And, and the recourse to that. So if they are not, and we don't get the provisions we are looking at, we would run a bill next year. So that would be the discussion then is, is how to address those statutory changes on our own solo, not as part of a committee bill. I just want to clarify what you're saying. Um, are they, is, is the consultant suggesting that we could put that language in the um, current sunset bill and uh, those regulatory um, uh, specifics that we were going to put in regulatory language following the sunset legislation? They would accept it better if it were all incorporated? No. That's not the case? I, I think we're still stuck on not wanting to reduce to 12 months, and if so, to go to an hour's. And they seem concerned about allowing those clinical rotation hours towards those hours. What's the concern? I think the lowering of the standard there and that those are different, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but that those are different hours and you already have that as a separate hours. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would even, um, if I would even identify it so much as concern as there, I think that the committee staff are just trying to really understand what the requirements are and what we're trying to propose. And there have been a lot of really good questions when it comes to, you know, what, why the need for the post didactic uh, requirement um, and how much would we reduce the requirement for months? Why not just go for just hours? So there, there have been a lot of discussion. I think we're still kind of just really trying to make sure everyone understands. Yeah. So hopefully we'll know more in the next uh, in the next few weeks. Yeah, we just wanted to provide the update though in the meantime that, yeah. you know, I know we had hoped to be working on this by now. So an update is in the process. We're still trying to get the changes that we requested and. Well, we appreciate that. Um, I'm just wondering if, I think there's some pretty compelling arguments for making regulatory language that restricts the use of pre-didactic um, rotations that are 100% supervised, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't make it feel as though it's somehow lesser mm -hmm. than if they receive that training. Um, and if we had, in fact, you had come up with some suggested percentages of hours that could be used from that. That's all been explained to them. Mm -hmm. um, they understand that ASHA's requirement says, not hours, it says 12 months. So the time element is, is important to some people, mm -hmm. um, not a lot of us, but some people do care about that. Yeah. And they're not probably going to change their mind for California. We'll see. I, and I, I think it's actually rather encouraging that they're this engaged and want to know this many details about the field accreditation and program requirements. and. And it's great that we did all the work we did in 2020 to, to ask the graduate programs all this information and be able to provide that sort of information so that they aren't thinking that they're only getting a couple hundred hours of clinical rotation. No, it, it's multiple hundreds of hours um, and that they're getting a lot of really good training throughout the program um, and then understanding what other states require. So I, I think they're asking good questions and we are, we are hopeful. It's just, it seemed a little preemptive to go ahead and let's do some language based on statutory language that may or may not look like what we've asked for. So oh, that makes sense. Um, can, but we didn't want you to think we weren't working on it at the same time. So just we wanted to provide that. that. <laughs> um, we were we had developed or worked on a survey to try to ask the those, the AD programs out there what their um, rotations look like, what kind of supervision they had. Can you address where things stand with that? Uh, we're in the middle of looking at those, um, addressing kind of multiple choice answers for them as well as open-ended questions for them. Um, and then hopefully within the next month or so, I'll be getting it ready. Fine. Okay, it, this was just an informational um, item. Is there, are there any other discussions? 
No, not on this item. Okay, so seeing none, um, I believe we will adjourn the um, the audiology practice committee meeting. Is that okay? No. For further public comment, <laughs> you should just you know have that tattooed on my forehead. Um, yes. Any further public comment? This is the moderator. Are you waiting on WebEx or are you waiting on in person? I'm waiting on WebEx. I'm sorry. My apologies. Um, we are now accepting public comment on WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial-in users, please dial star 3 to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comment. We're now going to take a few seconds to see if we have a request for public comment. Our first request for comment comes from uh, Christy. Bear with us just a moment, and we will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Oh, hi, I think I did better at unmuting this time. Um, so um, I'm from San Diego State University. Of course, this is a topic that is um, really important to us. Um, I, I'm, um, I'm a little confused uh, at, at some of what's been said, but I, I think the first thing that I would really like to know is what do you mean by pre-didactic? I can go ahead and it's probably wrong to call it pre-didactic, pre-completion of the didactic program. So currently the statute requires that the RPE hours be accrued after the completion of the didactic and clinical uh, requirements. So sorry, it's, 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 it's my own little shortcut to say pre-didactic. So no, it's not before you start teaching the didactic curriculum, but before completion of all the didactic. Okay, thank you. And that was our only request on WebEx at the moment. Do you wish to move to Ms. Dominguez? Sure. There's no one present here with me for public comment. Okay, so if there isn't any further discussion at this point, we would adjourn the audiology practice committee. We need another break or should we? Other board members would like to come up to the desk. Uh, the name nameplates. So we're adjourned and currently in recess. It's for WebEx folks. Okay, I would like to um, call to order the um, meeting of the Speech Language Pathology and Audiology and Hearing Aid Dispensers Board. It is um, Thursday, May 12th, and it is approximately 4.10 p.m. Uh, I would first like to um, call the roll. Um, Holly Kaiser? Here. Todd Borges? Here. Karen Chang? Here. Gilda Dominguez? Here. Debbie Snow? Here. Amy White? Here. Of course, I'm here. So we do have a quorum. Um, so it does say that I need to uh, ask Gilda to identify um, her location and address. I think you're okay for today because it's already been announced earlier. Uh, that was on the presumption we might be on tomorrow. Oh, okay. Is that okay, Michael? It is. We'll, we'll need to do it tomorrow. But we will do it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask for looking at item number two on the agenda for 
uh, public comment for items not on the agenda? I do have one um, a item from the public. It is from a Jill Axtel, um, and she wanted to request that those in charge of making license renewal decisions reconsider the requirement that 18 of our 24 CEU hours be live. Our state has had strict restrictions for the last two years, and many CEU providers are still not offering live CEUs. Many others offer primarily two-hour live classes during the work week. It is difficult to complete the CEU requirement as it requires requesting time off from employers for several days. Uh, please consider accepting video and self-study classes for the 24 hours required and add this to your next board meeting agenda. She also um, followed that with, I forgot to mention that some of the canceling live events, which if you're registered for the event and we're counting on it for live CEUs could put you in a bind to find another course. And she had sent an attachment on those courses. So thanks again for the consideration. That was the one public comment received via mail. Any public comment via WebEx? We are now accepting public comment via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please type the word comment into the lower right hand corner of your screen in the Q&A box and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we receive requests for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to move on to Ms. Dominguez? Uh, yes. Uh, there is no one else present with me to make a public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to item three, review and possible approval of the January 13th, 2022 board teleconference meeting minutes. Uh, Maria, do you, do you want to? Thank you, Dr. Rodrigo. Um, the board met in January for discussion and action on the FDA's proposed over-the-counter hearing aid. The board motioned to submit a public comment and there was no committee hearing that day. Any board discussion? Okay, I'd like to um, entertain a motion to accept um, the minutes from January 13, 2022. This is Gil Diamond. I'd like to ask for public comment. This is the moderator. Are you asking for comment from the room or from WebEx? Yeah, I'm sorry, that isn't clear. Oh, <laughs> we hardly have anybody in the room, so um, I I'm almost always referring to WebEx. We are now open for public comment on the motion for via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial in user, please dial star three to raise your hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comment. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we, re we receive a request for public comment. Seeing no requests via WebEx, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes, thank you. There's no one else present with me to make a public comment. 
Okay, is there any further board discussion on the minutes for January 13th? Seeing none, I'd like to call the vote. Sharice, do you want to do that? Absolutely. Dr. Raggio? Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Ms. Snow? Aye. Dr. White? Aye. The motion carries. Okay, moving on to um, agenda item number four, review and possible approval of the February 25th, 2022 board teleconference meeting minutes. Maria. Thank you, Dr. Raggio. The board uh, met in February um, to provide updates on the sunset review, um, the board comments to FDA, um, as well as regulations and legislation. The board adopted regulatory text, proposed regulatory text for notice to consumers and took a position on AB 1660. Uh, 1662 um, assembly member Gibson and there were no um, committees that day. Any board discussion? Uh, I have For the um, initials. Sorry, the initials for CASHA, there is no A, it's just C S H A. So that's under letter C, that paragraph, page six. Okay, thank you. That's noted. Sure, that's it. Any other comments or corrections? This is Gilda. I raised okay. my hand. Can I? Um, I just had one one other correction uh, on the on page four of nine. Uh, spelling correction for Pasadena, uh, March Pasadena, removing the second A. I'm, I'm sorry, Gilda. I didn't quite understand what you said. Could you repeat yourself? Oh, I found oh, it. just a spelling correction. For the name of Pasadena, yeah. there are two A's in the name on page oh, I see. four. <laughs> and Holly already mentioned the other, the other one. Oh, yeah, yeah I see it. <laughs> Thank you. It's been noted. Thank you. Oh. Can I have a motion to um, accept the minutes of February 25th, 22? Motion to accept the minutes as amended for February 25th, 2022. Second. Second. Okay, can we take public comment from uh, WebEx? We are now open for public comment via WebEx. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star 3 to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comment. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes. Still no one with me to make a public comment. And no further comment, board comment? Okay, Sharice, do you want to call the vote? Yes, Dr. Raggio. Aye. Ms. Kaiser? Aye. Mr. Borges? Aye. Ms. Chang? Aye. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Ms. Snow? Aye. Dr. White? Aye. Motion carries. We're going to skip agenda item five for now and bring that back tomorrow. We'll jump to the item number six, the executive officer's report. 
Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get started with the executive officer report, and um, that's item six in your binder, and there's some attachments that go along with it, and I'll be referring to those attachments. I'll, I'll start with our, our administrative update. I think the last time we, we reported to you, we were still looking at filling behind an analyst position that would assist us with the business modernization program. And we are still in the process of recruiting for that position. There have been some delays uh, for various issues, but we're hoping to evaluate the, the need in the process and continue on that track. Moving into the topic of business modernization, I think the last time we spoke, we were talking about the progress that we have been making, and not only the progress that we've made, but also the funding that was secured through the Technology Modernization Fund, upwards of um, over $400,000 for the board through a competitive process. Well, because of that, we've been able to make lots of progress, and our time has been meant, has been spent um, working on contracts, securing external vendors, and people to work on the Simply Gov solution development to work with our staff. So that's actually something else I, I did want to recognize the staff that that have been working on this project. It's a, it's a huge undertaking for any organization, but it's especially a huge undertaking for an organization as small as ours. We have uh, subject matter experts who have, have worked, um, who have to do their own work, do their own jobs, and in addition to that service subject matter experts in licensing, and that's Lisa Snelling and Dustin Kramer. In, in addition to that, we have a subject matter expert who has um, really, you know, stepped, stepped up for us. He's someone who understands enforcement and he understands licensing, and that's Tim Yang. So Tim Yang has been assigned the role of business project lead and owner, and he works directly with uh, Sharice Burns, our assistant executive officer, and, and he reports to us on, on the progress and on decisions that may need to be made throughout the process. So. That's, uh, that's something that I think we're, we're very fortunate to have staff that are skilled and have good understanding of our processes. And I just wanted to really um, recognize those staff members, especially Tim Yang. I don't think we could get as far as we have without his help so far. So um, we're able, we were able to secure the necessary contracts in the spring and are going to actually begin the project um, within this next month for, for business modernization. I wanted to also talk a little bit about outreach. Um, since uh, kind of everything is opening up and going back into, um, you know, in-person mode, we have been able to do some outreach. Some of this outreach has been online, but most recently in March, um, I was able to attend the California Speech Language Hearing Association Convention in Pasadena, along with our board members, Holly Kaiser and Gilda Dominguez. This is actually the first time we were asked to present at their general session that was well attended. I, I've been to the conference before, and we've been asked to present at breakout sessions. This conference can be attended, uh, I think, for, I think their numbers can be up to 2,000, if I'm correct. 3,000, thank you. Yeah. Uh, 3,000, so coming back from the pandemic, they were probably in the 2,000 range, but that still um, quite a crowd. Um, we had... We had a very um, engaged live crowd during the during the presentation, and we spoke on a variety of issues. The themes tend seem to be the importance of a license and the process of regulations. Uh, the cashier members out there are very interested in the regulatory processes that are causing delays in some of the the things the board is trying to accomplish as far as telesupervision. So it was a very engaged, very understanding a group of people. And I wanted to just ask Holly and uh, Gilda, Holly Kaiser and Gilda, if they have anything that they want to add. Um, well, I guess the, the thing that I thought about afterwards is that we had a lot of people come up to us um, 
when we came out of the talk that um, we're so happy that we were there in person and had lots of questions. Some of them were not really pertinent to the license board. They might have been about their credentials, you know, that kind of thing. And they were still trying to sort out what we manage, I mean, what's under our purview and what isn't. But there was a particular case where somebody was, um, uh, was work, wanted to work in a school district and she'd been working there with a, through a contract company and wanted to make a change and work directly for the school district and was told that she, um, anyway, it was a complication. She didn't have her credential, but she had a license. And I said, well, you can work for a school district with your license. That school district didn't know that, according to her. And, and so by giving her um, information um, about licensure that she could bring to her school um, administrators and HR, she actually was able to be, she was hired there. So it's a really nice outcome. Then I don't know if you had anything to add uh, to the conversation, Gilda, about our outreach event. Oh, yes. Um, the feedback that I received is that the presentation and how we uh, collaborated with each other on stage was fantastic. That was a quote. Um, and was very grateful for the information on, again, the regulatory process and uh, how things work, how things flow. The visuals um, that Paul had incorporated into the PowerPoint um, slide um, was very, very helpful. Um, you know, they like to take pictures, they like to take notes out there. And um, this was this uh, was appreciated because, uh, you know, people said, you know, they don't know what they don't know. Um, so this was very helpful information uh, for them to um, reference, whether they're a student, whether they're um, in their RPE um, or if they're licensed. Um, so it was just very, very helpful. Uh, and they're looking forward to um, having us back um, in future uh, venues, whether it be a workshop or a general session. And hopefully uh, this could be given for um, credits for CEs. Thank you, Gilda. In addition to that, you know, in addition to attending the convention, I've had meetings with uh, each of the three organizations that represent our license types in the last uh, three to four months. They include the California Academy of Audiology, the California Speech Language Hearing Association, and the Hearing Healthcare Providers of California. Also in April, I provided a licensing update and discussion to the California Council of Academic Programs in Communication Sciences and Disorders. Since it had been some time that I presented to the group, I actually gave them a, a full overview of licensing and kind of told them where we were and some of the licensing issues that, that we were that we were dealing with in our board business. Um, I was able to make a presentation to the San Francisco State Student Audiology Association, and that's probably one of the most impressive groups because there are these young people that are going through the program and just very interested and engaged in, in the licensing topic. And the very next week, I presented to the Hearing Loss Association of America, which was, um, by contrast, you know, mostly seniors and retired people. So one, one day we were talking to, you know, kids in college, the next day we were talking to um, the retired community. So th that was good. What we have coming up, I'm gonna be presenting to a group of Sac State students in a couple of months, and then the Cat California Academy of Audiology conference that is in the fall. Any questions so far on my report before I go into budget? Okay, you have um, you have in your budget report uh, a few budget documents, and that's item uh, 6E, which is your budget report. And then behind that, we have we have our fund condition. So if you look at the the actual budget report, it summarizes. The expenditures, it shows you a little bit of, of history of our expenditures. You can see that there are lines going back to 2018-17, and the yellow column represents the governor's budget. The blue column is our current year expenditures, and then the green column is our projections to year end. What we have on the surplus deficit side is the surplus projected at 18%. It's normal for our board to be anywhere from uh, 
three to five percent, even slightly over five percent. We have seen that in the past. We we have an inflated amount, and one of the reasons that we have that is because we were expected to spend more of our own um, fund on business modernization. But as we mentioned, because of the total modernization fund and some of the that that had a huge impact on the overage that we have, which is um, a little over six hundred thousand dollars. In addition to that, some salary savings from the delays of the implementation of the project. The next page is actually the fund condition, and I think this is um, really something that we we should look at periodically to kind of see where we are and how the changes that we have made have impacted our fund condition. You have basically uh, your beginning balance um, on the very top line. You have your revenue that comes in. And if you look at the revenue section, the first three lines that say other regulatory licenses and renewal fees, those are basically our licensing fees. And that accounts for most of our revenue. If we project our revenue, we usually do it conservatively. So if you look at 21-22, it's at, it's at 2.6 million. And then we estimate that our revenue is going to go up, conservatively speaking, to almost 2.9 million. It's likely to go higher than that. If you go to, mine's a two-pager. I think you probably all have two pages. So the very next page, you have your expenditures. And your expenditures are also assuming that you're going to expend your entire budget. So that's also a somewhat conservative estimate. But relatively speaking, you can see where we are. Our current, our current year, we're at five months in reserve. And this is a marker that, that we look at. This is something the legislature looks at as far as determining what a healthy fund is. It assumes that if you had no revenue, how many months could you operate without additional revenue? So at, at the current fiscal year, we are at five months. We were actually going down because we had a, a fiscal structural imbalance. With the increased uh, fees, licensing fees, you can see that that's trending upward to where next year we're conservatively um, estimating that we'll be at 6.3 months and then at 7.4 months. And that's our current, um, our current fund balance. Yes. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I just, um, when you were talking about, can we go to the budget report real quick? Yes. The DCA pro rata, is that the business modernization? No, right? Or yes? DCA pro rata. I'm sure if you want to answer the specific questions. <clears throat> about so the DCA pro rata in there is, um, it was calculated to include business modernization, of which it is not including that anymore. So it's normally around that that 355. Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, but right now, um, a lot of the technology modernization fund will cover the external vendor services. We still will be using some DCA resources to do the business modernization, so that's calculated in there. But a lot more of DCA pro rata is the distributed costs overall. So for the legal services, regulation services, human resources, printing, budgets, uh, all of the rest of it. So um, DCA pro rata is it's somewhat higher estimated for this year. Um, it's also some of the distributed costs. It goes up depending on how many boards are funding what and the total cost of DCA's operation distributed out. Um, and while it looks pretty gigantic, we're actually, I think, at um, close to 20%, but that's kind of the middle of the pack when we look at all the boards and bureaus at DCA. So um, we don't pay the highest percentage of mm -hmm. our budget in pro rata, but we also don't pay the least. So right. we're kind of middle of the packish. Okay. I also noticed that it's um, unencumbered right now. Uh, does it get encumbered like at the, towards the end of the fiscal year? Is that what it, why it is? Yes, I believe so. Okay. And then the 18%, that, inc that, that percentage is included with the, um, un with, with the unencumbered amount or the, which? It's assuming the encumbered amount. So okay. when they tell got us it. what our pro rata share is, we're going to pay that that year. Perfect. So got it. Okay. It will come out of the budget even if it's not out yet. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, Karen, did we answer your question about business modernization? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> 
have a, a list of the status of, of regulations and, and some of the rulemaking, the rulemaking files that we're working on, and we'll have more detail on in our regulations report tomorrow. We also have included the results from the practical examinations that have taken place uh, January through April. We tested about 69 candidates and, and the results are listed there. I've also included in the report an enforcement report and the, the licensees that have had discipline during the last 12 months. There's also included a, a licensing statistical report and an enforcement statistical report in your materials. And to clarify, those are hand carry materials that have been given to you today. They are not on the website yet, but they will be posted after the meeting. Are there any questions on the report? Nobody else is whether audiologists took the exam January through April. I, I think they, like <laughs> no, I think they did. That, that was, that specific category is um, trainee categories. So if you look down further, you can see the, the audiologists that took it. I think there's only eight temporary audiologists, audiologists temporary, so. Applicants without supervision. Mm. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Um, moving down to item seven, and since Ms. Miller is here with us, um, I'd like to move to the um, DCA update and invite uh, Brianna to come up and talk to us here. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Sorry, I'm hopeless. Slow. Hopeless. Um, yeah, we need to take public comment from WebEx on the uh, executive officer report. We are now open for public comment on the executive officer's report. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star three to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to move to Ms. Dominguez? Sure. Thank you. There's no one else present with me to make a public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, now Ms. Miller would like to <laughs> join us. All right, how's that? Everyone picking up okay? Good. All right, well, good afternoon, board members. I'm Brianna Miller with the Department of Consumer Affairs Board and Bureau Relations. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to provide a department update to you today. I'd like to start my update with a note about the transition back to in-person meetings. On April 1st, boards and bureaus returned to meeting in accordance with all aspects of the Open Meeting Act, including publicly noticing all meeting locations. There is legislation, AB 1733, which would permanently allow boards and committees to meet remotely while also providing both virtual and physical options for members of the public to participate. If passed by the legislature and signed by the governor, this bill would take place immediately. Unfortunately, this bill was not heard in policy committee before the deadline. Therefore, it will not move forward this year. If your board took a position or is planning to take a position on this legislation, it may still be helpful to share this information with the authors and the committees. Please be sure to send a copy of your position letter to Jennifer Simoes, DCA's Deputy Director of Legislation, so that she can facilitate this communication. Recently, Board and Bureau Relations distributed to all board and committee members guidelines and requirements to adhere to when conducting in-person meetings. 
In some, this communication addresses requirements for meetings under the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, making sure you adhere to local public health guidelines at a meeting location, face coverings, and vaccination verification and testing. DCA has also shared guidance and tips from the California Health and Human Services Agency to reduce the spread of COVID-19 for in-person meetings. Additionally, although state guidance has relaxed mandatory face coverings, the California Department of Public Health strongly recommends that individuals continue to mask in, in indoor settings. DCA has made available signage, which you can post at your meetings to notify attendees of this face covering recommendation. Please be aware of public, uh, pardon me, please be aware of changing public health guidance and remember that as state representatives, we are all expected to adhere to state and local orders while carrying out our duties. If you have any questions as you're preparing for your upcoming meetings, please do not hesitate to reach out to Board and Bureau Relations for questions. Oops. Next, I'd like to share a bit about the Board and Bureau Relations newsletter. Another communication which uh, you may recently have received from Board and Bureau Relations is our new quarterly newsletter. I'm pleased to announce that on April 5th, Board and Bureau Relations distributed the first iteration titled Board Members Did You Know to all of our board and committee members. This newsletter is an outreach tool to keep you informed of various departmental activities, as well as information which may be impactful to you as a board member. We hope this is something you will find helpful and we welcome your feedback and for future distributions. And if you did not receive the newsletter, please reach out to us so we can verify we have the correct email address for you. Moving on to a note about DCA's open meeting survey. DCA will be administering surveys until further notice to capture and track the costs and attendance for all meetings since April 1st, when all aspects of the Open Meeting Act returned, or resumed rather, to demonstrate the benefits of conducting remote meetings as allowed under the prior executive order. We have distributed to all boards and bureaus a request that you complete the survey 30 days after each meeting held. Should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Moving on to key positions filled at DCA. Well, I'm excited to share that there are three new members of DCA's executive team that began serving in March. As I reported at your last meeting, Tanya Corcoran began serving as the department's first compliance and equity officer, effective March 2nd. Additionally, Terrence Brass joined DCA as the chief of the Division of Investigation, or DFI, effective March 28th. And as DFI chief, Mr. Brass will lead a team responsible for providing investigative services to DCA's boards and bureaus with the mission to protect and serve California's consumers. And last but not least, Adon Prahadi was selected to serve as the department's internal audits chief, also effective March 28th. And as DCA's internal audits chief, Mr. Prahadi will lead audits efforts to provide independent uh, consulting services designed to add value and improve DCA Act operations. Next, a reminder about the board member orientation training. As a reminder, board members who were recently appointed or reappointed need to attend the board member orientation training within a year of that appointment date. You can register for the BMOT through the Learning Management System, or LMS for short, uh, which is DCA's training portal. Live virtual trainings will be held June 15th and October 12th this year. This training provides an overview of the roles and responsibilities of a board member, which includes expected conduct, like the importance of voting and meeting attendance, how to prepare for meetings, taking positions on bills, the role of a board member, and the, and the role of the board member in the adjudication process. In addition, board members will be educated about the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act and applicable conflicts of interest. And finally, I am saddened to report that Carrie Holmes, Deputy Director of Board and Bureau Relations, will be leaving DCA. Her last day is actually tomorrow, May 13th. Um, Deputy Director Holmes joined DCA in 2020 and has since dedicated her efforts to ensuring that Board and Bureau Relations provides the highest level of support and service to our boards and bureaus. As Deputy Director Holmes and I are a two-person team, um, I can personally attest that it has been a joy to work with her and she will surely be missed. During this transitional period, Board and Bureau Relations will continue to ensure continuity of services to all of our boards and bureaus. And that concludes my presentation. As always, Board and Bureau Relations is here to help your board. So if there's anything we can do to help you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Are you responsible for the leadership meetings that, that you've been offering for your office? Yeah, that's a collaborative effort, but we, Board and Bureau Relations is certainly 
I just want to comment that they're really helpful. Okay. And I've learned a great deal from the couples that I have attended. So I hope you'll keep doing it. Absolutely. Glad to hear it. Yeah, we're just going to then open it up for board discussion. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do that. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, sorry. I was jumping the gun. Um, I, I think because your mask, I didn't hear very clearly sorry. what you said about the survey that you'd like us to fill out, like when, would we have received it yet or we get it after this meeting? Yeah, that was more, it, that's informational for the board, but it, it's something that staff will execute. So it's um, something that after, per each meeting, starting April 1st, now that we've gone back to fully in-person meetings, um, the your staff has received a survey from DCA um, that it tracks, you know, attendance, okay. budget, travel, you know, just so we can inform now that things have returned to in-person, how that's impacting our boards and bureaus. So well, it's not for us to fill out. It's not staff. for board okay, members, it's for staff. Going. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other board questions or discussion? All right. Seeing okay. none, I'd like to open it up for public comment uh, via WebEx. We are once again open for public comment. If you would like to make a comment on this matter, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. If you are a dial-in user, please dial star 3 to raise your hand. and We will call on people in the order we have requests for comments. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment here, would you like to move to Ms. Dominguez? Yes. There's no one present here with me to make a public comment. Okay, thank you, thank you. So it is almost 10 minutes to five. I think we were considering um, adjourning um, at this time and, and starting again tomorrow. Everybody's still in agreement with that? Okay. So I'd like to um, adjourn the meeting of the Speech, Language, Pathology, and Audiology and Hearing Aid Dispensers Board. <laughs>